Okay, so welcome to lecture six on the quantum Kuklevin theorem. This is for the winter 2020 offering of quantum complexity theory at Paderborn University. Today's lecture is rather on the long side. We're looking at about 14 to 15 pages, um, which is much longer than usual. So I'm not gonna be able to cover it all in one video lecture. So as usual, you know, please refer to the course notes. Do work all through, through all the exercises on your own um, to fill in the rest of the details. Just one announcement today, assignment three is due tomorrow before tutorial. Okay, so the quote atop this week's lecture is by Richard Karp, and here he's talking about one of the two founders of the Kuklevin theorem, who was uh, Stephen Cook. So Stephen, by the way, was in the, the West, basically. The other founder of the theorem was Leonid Levin, who was in the East, and they founded this theorem in the early 70s, independently. So Richard writes about Stephen Cook. Steve Cook was primarily in math, but also in the new CS department. Okay, so here um, Richard Karp is talking about the UC Berkeley uh, math and CS departments in the, the 1960s, basically. And so Richard continues to write, it is to our everlasting shame that we were unable to persuade the math department to give him, meaning Steve, tenure. Perhaps they would have done so if he had published his proof of the MP completeness of satisfiability a little earlier. Okay, so the reason why I like to bring up this quote at this time is, you know, the Cook-Levin theorem is one of, you know, the cornerstones of complexity theory, right, um, and of theoretical computer science, right? And yet, you know, it really shows the human side of, you know, these leaders, these juggernauts in our field, like Steve Cook, Richard Karp, you know, even they face the same trials and tribulations that we do, right, on an everyday basis, right? So Stephen Cook, for example, is denied tenure, right, at uh, UC Berkeley. And so I think it's always important to remember this, right? When we look at look back at the history books, you know, you kind of see only, the, you know, the highlights, let's say, or the, the good sides of, um, you know, these these top people and you know they face the same problems that we face on an everyday basis so it's good to remember that as we face our everyday problems you know on a day-to-day -day basis right okay so the cook levin theorem is of course one of the the main developments in theoretical computer science of the last century what it basically says is that the boolean constraint satisfaction problem so i'll say three cent right is mp complete okay remember which means that it's as hard as every other problem in NP, and unless, you know, later on, you know, we, we formally have stated it this way, right, that uh, unless P equals to NP, we don't believe it can be solved efficiently. Okay, so the quantum analog of this is going to give a quantum problem, which is similarly going to be complete for quantum NP, QMA. Okay, that's going to be called uh, the, the local Hamiltonian problem, and the reason why is because the name is inspired by physics, so we'll get to it in a second. But the real reason why the quantum cook levin theorem is interesting is because what it says about nature. Remember, this course is really about supposed to be about the interplay between um, what physics allows in terms of computation and what computation allows physics to do uh, in some sense as well, right? There's this back and forth, right? And this is exactly where we're going to see that, right? So one of the primary reasons um, for quantum computing to be proposed as a model of computing to begin with, right, in the 80s is because... It, you know, it seems like there's an exponential overhead in studying these quantum systems and these properties of these quantum systems, right? And the quantum cook levin um, theorem can be seen as saying that a certain physically motivated problem, which is, you know, roughly speaking, estimating the ground state energy of a physical system, like if you take a system and you cool it to near absolute zero, what energy level does it settle into? It turns out that this problem is intractable. Okay, it's hard for quantum NP. Okay, so this is in some sense can be viewed as a rigorous uh, justification of, you know, this intuition that quantum systems are hard to study. Okay, so that's the motivation for why we care about this theorem. And of course, as computer scientists, we care because it gives us um, an, the analog of the theory of empty completeness in the quantum setting. In order to talk about this theorem, I'm going to start with the, uh, reminding you of the classical analog, the cook levin theorem, because the same techniques used to prove that are going to be very useful in the quantum setting. Uh, of course, I'll, I'll just do this kind of at a high level sketch for the classical cook levin theorem. But nevertheless, the main ingredients will be there. Okay, in our discussion. Okay. So, the cook levin theorem, in brief, right, theorem one of the notes, 
says that sat is MP complete. Okay, so remember what is sat? Sat is this problem where I give you as input uh, a CNF formula, right? A Boolean formula. And uh, your goal is to find a satisfying assignment for this formula. Okay. And um, remember what it meant to be MP complete was that I can take any problem in MP and I can encode it as a special case of sat, right? So how do we prove that, right? How do I prove that um, I can take the action of any non-deterministic Turing machine and I can embed it into an instance of sat, right? Such that the sat instance is satisfiable if and only if the MP complete, uh, sorry, the NP Turing machine, the non-deterministic Turing machine was going to accept. That's what we want to do. And um, the basic proof ideas here at a high level are going to carry over to the quantum setting. Okay, so let's be um, slightly formal here, right? Let's sketch how this reduction goes, right? So let L, okay, so be a language. with an NP verifier. Okay, so I'm gonna take the verification view of NP, meaning, remember I have a deterministic Turing machine and it takes in a proof. Okay, and um, okay, well, technically speaking, I'll need to remind you of some of these details. Q, sigma, gamma, uh, delta, Q naught. What else was there? Uh, and then there's the accepting state and the rejecting state, okay? And Z is going to be an input, right? So it's some number of bits long, okay? So just to remind you, right, these are uh, the, this is the state space of the Turing machine, right? What states the machine can go into. These are basically um, the input and tape alphabet, so what kind of symbols you're allowed to write down. This is the transition function. Okay. Uh, start state. And these are accept and reject states. Okay. Okay, so I'm given an input, and the goal is so we want to map Z, this input, right, to the Turing machine, to uh, a CNF formula. Um, I think that's a typo on the notes, right? So this takes uh, m bits as input and outputs a single bit, um, such that uh, phi is satisfiable if and only if z, the input, is in my language L, right? So here's z. Remember, I started with some language. And so this is the name of the game, right? And of course, I want the reduction to run in polynomial time. Okay, so in particular, we're going to give a poly time many one reduction. Okay, so it's going to be a mapping reduction. Okay, so the key idea, how do we do this, right? So I want to design my formula so it in some sense forces, you know, in some, okay, it forces you, quote unquote, to simulate the behavior of this Turing machine, M, right? That, that's the goal. And so what are the, the key properties? Like, what does it mean for the Turing machine to run properly, right, uh, given an input Z? Like, what are the key, uh, well, properties of the machine we need to focus on, if you will? Okay? So the, here they are, three key properties. And the, these are exactly what we're going to see in the quantum setting as well. Well, you have to start in the right place, right? Once you start in the right place, you have to make sure that all the steps happen according to you know the rules of the Turing machine. And finally, we want to make sure that you output, you end in the right place, you output the right answer, right? So first, we want to make sure that the tape is initialized correctly. Okay, so that's um, so. What does this mean? This means that um, the tape starts with uh, input. I think that's also a typo. Let me just make a note. This should be input C here. Okay. 
and then uh, blanks elsewhere. Okay, so when you start the Turing machine, you know, you should just have the input um, Z in the front and blanks everywhere else. Let me do the, the last step, so correct output. Okay, so once you hit the end of the computation, it must be the case that, um, you know, we end in this accepting state if and only if uh, the input was in the language. So we end in Q accept if and only if Z is in the language. Okay, and finally, of course, all the intermediate steps should proceed according to the rules of the machine, right? So correct propagation. Okay, here we go. So uh, step I plus one follows from step I via the transition function delta, right? So remember this is, uh, here's delta and that's our delta over here, okay? So it should, of course, follow the rules of delta. Okay, so the whole idea is that we're gonna enforce each of these properties by um, creating a separate Boolean formula. In the end, we'll kind of stitch all the formulas together. Okay, so in particular, we're going to uh, have a, a Boolean formula for this. Um, the first one will be called uh, phi in. Okay, that'll make sure that the input is correctly encoded. We'll have a formula for propagation, a formula for output. Okay. And now there's one other formula we do have to encode, which we won't have to worry about in the quantum setting, but classically we do have to technically worry about it, which is, well, how do I know that um, this, uh, the Turing machine um, sorry, the, the formula, how do I make it encode the right symbols from the Turing machine, if you will, okay? Because, you know, remember we had this uh, sigma and gamma, the allowed symbols in the alphabets, right? We have to somehow allow those and only those symbols to be um, present in the simulated competition in some sense, okay? So first, let's start with, here's a construction sketch. Okay, so let's start with, um, well, before I do that, let me give you the high-level idea. Okay, so so how are we going to do this, right? These are the basic ideas, right? Um, like the basic components, but how do we put them together, right? So the idea is that um, the Turing machine uh, can be viewed as a sequence of time steps, right? At each time step, you know, you have this configuration, right? Remember that uh, by definition, um, at any fixed time, the Turing machine's configuration can be specified by, um, I want to be a little bit formal here because we're going to use this, right? X, Q, Y. Um, Q is the current state. Okay. And here, the strings X and, and Y here, these are the tape contents. If you kind of concatenate them together, these are the tape contents. Contents, right? And the whole idea is that, you know, why was the, why is the Q here in between X and Y? Like, why did I split the tape contents into two parts? Well, because this also serves the purpose of saying that um, the head of the Turing machine is on the first symbol of Y. Okay, so that's why I put the, the state kind of in between these two strings uh, to denote where is the head right now. Okay, so it's right at the front of Y. Okay, so at any point in time, I can describe the, the full state of the Turing machine by one of these configurations, right? It tells me uh, what's on the tape, what's my current state, and where's the head. Okay, and so I can view these as a, as a sequence of configurations now, right? And I can write them down kind of like this, right? I mean, you start in a certain configuration, right? Uh, I don't want to write it as a tape, per se, right, and so forth. This continues, dot, 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 right? So maybe at time t equals zero, t equals one, and so forth. And in the beginning, what you know, what should this thing look like? Well, at the beginning, you should have z1, z2, uh, dot, 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 zn, that's your input, kind of on the first n cells of the tape, if you will. And then you should have blanks everywhere else. Okay, technically speaking, um, I'm cheating a little bit, right? Because I wanted to say that, um, the start configuration should be here, right? Because this is not necessarily just the tape contents, this is showing me the full configuration of the Turing machine, right? So this tells me that 
at time zero, I'm in the initial state Q0, um, and the head is kind of at the next position, okay? And this is what the tape currently looks like. Okay, and then um, time T1 is kind of what the, what the next configuration of the Turing machine should be once you take your first step. Okay. Okay, so this kind of uh, joint picture here is what we're gonna call a tableau, okay? And it encodes kind of the full uh, sequence of uh, steps that the Turing machine takes, right? And each of these steps, of course, should be according to delta, right? And finally, at the very last step, right, when we finish, what should happen is that, you know, somewhere in here should be the Q accept state, okay? So, you know, if you want without loss generality, this could be at the very first cell and everything else could be initialized to zeros or reset to zeros at this point. Doesn't really matter, okay? So this is the last step. And of course, the last step will be some polynomial in the input size n, right, the number of time steps. Okay, so this is kind of what we want to set up. We want to kind of um, encode our Boolean formula to um, effectively simulate this kind of tableau, like rows of a tableau, okay? So the first thing we need to do is, you know, we need to set the, the playing rules for what's allowed to go into each of these kind of rows of the tableau, and that's going to be uh, this one formula Q alpha, or sorry, phi alpha, which I didn't really write down yet. So what uh, is allowed in each cell, let's say. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to say uh, the following, right? Um, so what should be allowed is um, a symbol, right, from the tape or um, I mean, technically speaking um, we also have of course the the input alphabet but let's just assume that the tape alphabet um, well the tape alphabet always is assumed to contain a sigma so I guess I could erase this okay so what are you allowed to put in each cell where well, you're allowed to put one of these symbols in right um, something from either a current state or um, a tape symbol okay from your Turing machine and so how do I enforce in my formula that, you know, we are only allowed these symbols? Well, we use, the trick is to use um, an indicator variable. Okay. And what does that mean? That means that we're going to introduce a Boolean variable now. So for all um, positions i and j, okay, so... Um, I mean, we have two uh, indices here, right, i and j, because, you know, one index will tell us which row of the tableau we're in, and the other one, j, will tell us the column, right? So it's going to be a Boolean um, variable. Uh, and it's going to say x, i, j, and s, right? And what is the idea here? This thing will be set to 1 if uh, cell i, comma j of our tableau contains the symbol s and remember the symbol s is well either the tape alphabet or it's it's the state right so this is um, what we're going for right and otherwise it's zero so you know it's a boolean variable by doing this um, we're allowed to we're able to encode kind of a higher dimension alphabet just using zeros and ones that's the, the beautiful trick of this right so for each entry in our table you know we have one of these indicator variables and so, for example, if you want to, um, therefore, so here's an example, right? If you want to uh, say that at least one symbol per cell, uh, and sorry, in cell i comma j, right? How do you do that? Well, you just do a big or, right? You do an or over all uh, symbols s and gamma union q and then you just make sure that at least one of these indicator variables is true right so if at least uh, whenever the indicator variable is true it tells you that the corresponding symbol s is in position ij right and notice how the way i've written it there's only one kind of variable here right I, right now ij is fixed okay so this makes sure there's at least one symbol in the cell 
And of course, I don't want to have at least one symbol. I really want exactly one symbol, right? I don't want to put more than one symbol uh, per cell in this tableau. And so, you know, you would need to add um, another constraint, right? To say, for example, that, um, so this is exercise uh, three. Exercise three, um, how to enforce exactly one uh, symbol in IJ. Okay. And of course, the basic idea here is that we don't want, um, when you fix IJ, we don't want two of these variables to be true. There should only be a one, right? So if this formula is true, then there's at least one true symbol. And so what you want to do is something like uh, this, okay, right? You want to say that um, basically for all S and um, S not equal to S prime, so for every pair of indices that are not the same, or symbols that are not the same, right? We want to say that, um, you know, if this one is true, right? So meaning we've set S, then XIJS um, is false, right? This thing, and we want to say, um, whoops, the, op the opposite as well, right? Sorry, this is a prime. And if uh, S prime is true, then it must be the case that uh, S is false. Okay, so only one of those two symbols can be switched on. I've written this in terms of implications, but you know, I encourage you to go look up um, how you can convert an implication into um, ends and ors, basically, and not gates. Okay. So this basically allows us to encode using a Boolean formula that each cell contains precisely one symbol. This is for a fixed i, j, but of course now I can do a big or over all the cells i and j uh, to encode uh, this property for every single cell. Okay. So again, this is supposed to be a high level sketch. Um, I'll let you uh, look at the notes for slightly more details. And you know, I encourage you to go through the exercises of making this fully formal. Okay, so this is just going to make sure that the cells contain the right types of symbols and nothing else. So now what I know is that, you know, what, what do we attain? Like in my mind, you know, I have this tableau and I know that for each kind of cell in this tableau, there's precisely one symbol from the allowed symbol set. That's it, I don't know anything else at this point. Okay, the symbols can be arranged in any order right now. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to do, remember, is so now that I know what symbols are allowed in here, now I want to encourage the first row of this uh, tableau to, incur to encode precisely the starting configuration, right? And that means that the tape should be initialized correctly, meaning um, I should have the state of uh, the, the start state of the Turing machine in the first symbol, right? And then I should have um, the end bits of the input followed by blanks. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, now I'm going to just add more formulas now, right? And I'm gonna use, of course, this encoding now that we've started with these indicator variables, right? So how to initialize the tape. Okay. And so what we do is we do the following, right? I add a Boolean uh, formula. Okay, and so I'm gonna call this one phi in now. Maybe I should, um, sorry, let's be clear. So um, so up here, you know, I just showed you how to do this for one cell ij, but you know, then you can take, um, kind of do the same thing now, take a big um, and over all the different cells to make sure that simultaneously these conditions hold for all cells. And this one I wanna call phi alpha just for later reference, okay? So the big formula, when you kind of put all those constraints together, what you'll get is phi alpha. And now the next one I'm adding here is phi in, and this is basically going to kind of be a brute force hard coding, right? So remember what I want is that the first symbol here should be q naught, so let's just do that, right? So literally I'm gonna say, um, you know, x at position one, one in the table, right? So that's the top left corner. The symbol I want there to be is q naught, okay? And, okay, the next symbol was supposed to be the first symbol of the input, right? So here, at position row one, column two, I should have the first symbol of the input, that's Z1. Okay, so 
And now we just keep playing this game, right? Row one, column three, now I have Z2, and so forth. Okay, so you know at the end, um, we're going to have um, the last bit of the, the input, and then you could, of course, have um, enforced blank symbols after that. Okay, But this is the basic idea. Remember, the goal is to give you intuition here. So now I have um, this formula, right? It's a valid Boolean formula. This will be true if and only if um, all these bits are kind of forced to be set exactly like they should when the machine starts. Okay, that's tape uh, initialization. The next thing I want to jump to, so now I know that the first line of this thing looks correct. And before doing the transition function, let me do the last step. And the last step intuitively just says that you know, somewhere we should be in the accepting state, you know, that that's at least what an accepting Turing machine would have done. And that's kind of what we're hoping. Remember, I want this formula to be satisfiable, if and only if I end up in an accept state. So I'm looking for an accept state in that last step. So um, correct output, this was the, the last thing we wanted to do before we get to propagation. And what does this mean? Um, I'm going to be, you know, relax the definition just a little bit um, to be make it a little bit nicer. But here, the formula we're going to define is v out, and all this thing says is that um, I'm going to take a big OR over all i comma j. Although in principle, you could just restrict this to look in the last row if you like. But for simplicity, let me just do it this way. And this just says that, you know, in position i j, we have the accept state somewhere. Okay, so somewhere in this tableau, at some cell ij, we have the accept state. Again, with that last generality, you can assume that's the last row in the tableau if you want. And so you could really restrict this or to run over the last row. But I don't want to introduce um, notation for the last row, so I'm just going to write it this way. Okay, so this is a formula that enforces. Now I know that if you satisfy this clause, uh, because it's an or, at least one of these variables has to be true. And that means that at some position ij, you have the accepting state. OK, so somewhere in this table now is this accept state. It could be in multiple positions, but I don't really care. Okay. And the reason I don't care is because the last thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to enforce now that you know each line of this tableau will properly follow from the previous line according to the, the transition function of the Turing machine. OK, so, so now I know that there will be no kind of funny business that will take place between the first step and the last step. So that's the last ingredient we need, which is correct propagation. All right. Okay, and so what does this do? The, you know, the goal of this again is, you know, let me just give you an example. I think um, again, this is just supposed to be a high-level intuitive sketch. So suppose I have, you know, a sequence of two lines, right? Maybe the configuration in the first step was this okay so meaning my tape contained 000111 and the head right so just let me be crystal clear uh, for this example just to make sure we do it concretely right that means that the head is here right it's on the one because that's where this queue is it's right before the one and in the next time step what happens is that imagine you know we um we were we were at this position, right? Um, we overwrote that position with a zero, right? Um, so that's why you know this symbol is now a zero, and then we move the head one to the right, uh, and that's why you see now the the configuration is now here. So now we're um, the head would be on on this symbol now, right? And this would become a zero, and we move to a new state q prime. Okay, so this is a let's say a val let's imagine this is a valid sequence of configurations. And now, of course, I want to put down Boolean formulas that are going to make sure that we correctly encode um, this valid propagation from one line to the other. Okay. And the, the key insight here is that it turns out that to understand what is valid and what's not in this picture, it fully suffices to look at not the kind of the, I don't need to look at the full string, um, the full um, rows at the same time, right? I don't care about all the digits, right? What I really care about is, you know, where is the head and kind of the immediate symbols to the left and right? Because in, in one step, what can a Turing machine do, right? It can rewrite kind of, it overwrites what's in that cell and then it moves one to the right, one to the left. Like nothing else should change, right? 
So I only care about kind of like the blocks of three symbols at a time. And so it suffices for me to worry about, let's say the zero, 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 um, the zeros, uh, maybe I should, just two by three sub windows, if you will, right? So there's the next two by three window, then you get zero Q one, zero Q prime one, um, and then you get um, Q one one, zero Q prime one, and finally we have one, 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 Q prime one, one. Okay, so for example, I mean, obviously this block is that one, for example, right? And obviously um, this one here is uh, this one here, okay? So all I have to do is look at the transition function, which is kind of a fixed function for the Turing machine, right? It, it's constant size, has nothing to do with the input. And, you know, based on that, you know, I could write down exactly the, you know, these, these two by three windows that are allowed, right? I can characterize fully what are the set of allowed two by three windows, okay? So delta characterizes the full set of allowed two by three uh, windows, if you will. Okay, so maybe for example, um, you know, these are all the allowed windows, and then you could say that okay, well, you know, in each window, like so, you look at um, your entire tableau, and then you look at all the two by three blocks, and then for each of the two by three blocks, you have to enforce that you know one of the valid configurations is present. Okay, so you know here's five examples of configurations that might be valid, and for any particular valid configuration, say this one, right? How do I enforce that two by three window to look like this? Well, it's identical to what we did here, right? How did I enforce the input? Um, the first row to have a certain value or, or a certain uh, set of symbols. Well, we just hard coded it, right? And you here you do the same thing. You just say that you know in this two by three block. The first three symbols should be 0, Q1. I could hard code that. And then the second three symbols should be 0, Q prime 1. OK? So I can hard code it. And basically, what I would do is something like this. I would say, kind of, um, for all uh, 2 by 3 uh, windows, um, let's just give it a name, like W, right? Uh, I'm going to encode some constraint on those 2 by 3 windows that'll enforce it to be. Um, something allowed by the delta uh, function, okay? And you know, what that is, of course, depends fully on delta, right? We can't write this in some sort of abstract closed form way, right? Um, although in the quantum setting, we'll see it'll be a lot nicer, actually. We'll be able to do say, say something nicer. And the point is that then I'll kind of stitch these all together to get the propagation uh, term phi prop. Okay? That's, that's basically the, the rough idea. Okay, so, um, and now this will make sure that, let's just double check that we've understood this, right? We go back to our tableau. Um, I know that all the symbols are correct in this thing. They're the right type of symbols. I know the first line is correctly initialized. I know the, the last line will contain an accept state at some point. And now I also know, thanks to the propagation term, that um, for every two by three kind of block or window in this thing, um, it's a set of symbol that's allowed by my transition function delta. So in other words, this line will always, for example, follow legally from the previous line according to the transition function. Okay. And that essentially, um, um, of course, all those conditions can only be satisfied, right, simultaneously, including ending in an accept state, if and only if the Turing machine, right, uh, started in um, some, in its initial configuration and ended um, at um, in an accept state, okay? Um, <clears throat> now I, I kind of, I think I'm cheating a little bit here in the sense that, so first let me be clear uh, what the final formula is and I'll tell you then how I'm cheating, right? So the final formula is what? It's just phi, right? And it's just, we stitch together everything, right? So we start in the right place, uh, we end in the right place, intermediate set terms are all correct and symbols are all correctly set. So that's our full formula, and you know, um, I'll let you think about why this formula is satisfiable if and only if um, the initial input we started with is in the language. And this is where I have to tell you a little bit about the cheating, because I started by saying uh, we're going to take the verifier view of 
NP, and you know, actually technically that's not what I've sketched here, although it's very easy to change it to be that way, right? So if you want to um, make this thing encode uh, the idea of an MP verification where the, you know, the tableau is deterministic and you give me a proof, then basically what you'd have to do is you would have to kind of leave some space here, right? So here's your input, right? And then um, you know, you'd have some sequence of cells, basically, whose values are not prefixed, right? So whatever the proof size is allowed to be, right? We do not enforce anything on those cells. And then, of course, afterwards, you can put your blanks in, right? OK, so when we went to, and you know, the idea here is that we don't enforce anything on these cells other than they should um, contain valid kind of inputs, uh, sorry, symbols from the, the tape alphabet. And then, of course, the idea is that, you know, this formula will be satisfiable if and only if there's some way to set this thing appropriately, right? So that then the Turing machine's actions will correctly lead to accept. So let me be uh, slightly more precise here. Uh, when we talk about the input, um, yeah, the only thing we would have to change then uh, is over here, right? Here uh, we would have to um, kind of leave uh, a subset, or let me just say the, the proof locations unconstrained. Okay, so remember before we were saying we we're going to kind of hard code all the entries to be the input bits. Um, you know, or the, the start configuration and then blanks at the end. Now we have to kind of leave some gap there uh, for all the proof bits. Um, we don't want to constrain what their values are, right? Because we don't know what the proof is ahead of time. Okay. So that's the basic idea of how the Cook Levin theorem works. And now when we do the quantum version of this, we're going to see that um, we're going to have a very similar structure in the sense that we will have, again, initialization, propagation, output okay okay so that's it that's the extent to which I want to go into um, the classical cook Levin theorem let's talk now about um, what it means to even talk about quantum constraint satisfaction okay because that's going to be the we're going to talk about the quantum analog of CSPs and the problem is going to be something called the local Hamiltonian problem Okay, so this is section two in the notes. And what does this say? Okay, so there's something really beautiful that comes out of this cook levin theorem, right? And it's really just a property of Turing machines, which is that the cook levin theorem works because computation is local, right? At each step of the computation, right? I don't need to worry about, uh, remember when I was looking at the propagation Hamiltonian, I don't need to worry about the entire kind of um, row, uh, the two, uh, subsequent rows. I don't have to worry about the uh, checking them all at the same time, right? I could just look locally in these two by three windows, right? And then kind of brute force enumerate through all the different configurations that are valid and put down a formula for that, okay? Computation is local. That's because Turing machines only look at the local, the, the current position, change that and move one step left, one step right. That's it. And now, um, the amazing thing is that just like computation being local, it turns out that nature is local as well. And that's kind of the starting point for the story. Okay, so um, first let me tell you what a Hamiltonian is. We've sort of already seen this, uh, by the way, in our exercises. In our previous, um, I believe in assignment two. And the basic idea here is the following, right? Which says that, where are these Hamiltonians going to come from? Well, I mean, what is a Hamiltonian, right? Well, this goes back to something called the Schrödinger equation. Remember, I said this is going to be a physically motivated lecture, though you don't really need so many physics for this, right? And the Schrödinger equation basically says, remember that um, if I have a quantum state psi, right, and I want to know, you know, how does this ch thing change uh, with respect to time, right, um, in terms of a differential equation, okay? Then, you know, the rate of change of this thing with respect to a time parameter t. And here I'm just going to put you know the, the complex i because that's how the equation works. But you know you could ignore it for our discussion here if you like. It basically turns out the rate of change is just you take psi and you hit it with a Hermitian operator. This is a Hermitian operator, and this is acting on you know n qubits, let's say. Okay. 
And the name we give to this is the Hamiltonian of the system. Okay, This operator tells us everything about how psi is going to evolve in time. Okay. And you know, if you solve this, um, if you solve this differential equation, what you'll find is that the state at time t of our system is what? Well, it's just the initial state times nothing other than e to the minus i h t. Okay, so here again you see the Hamiltonian showing up, right? That's the Hamiltonian. This is the, the time of evolution. So how long you waited for your system to evolve in time. Okay. And remember from your assignment, by definition, this thing will be, not by definition, but I mean you could show that this thing is unitary. Okay. And this was the where unitarity in quantum systems came from, right? This is why we said unitary uh, dynamics are the only one that are allowed by quantum mechanics, because that's what the Schrodinger equation tells us. Okay. So this is where the notion of a Hamiltonian comes from. Okay, and that, now we're going to talk about that in further depth, right? But that's the physical motivation. Okay, these things are basically the prescription for what a quantum system does. For every quantum system out there, there's some Hamiltonian that perfectly characterizes the system that tells us everything we need to know. Okay, now, of course, the problem is what the problem is that. This is an n qubit operator, right? So it's huge. I can't write it down. It's 2 to the n by 2 to the n dimension. And so now we ask, sure, this is what the Schrodinger equation says is possible, right? But what do we actually see in nature? What kind of systems do we see? What kind of Hamiltonians happen uh, to show up? And it turns out that just like computation is local, uh, that's supposed to be my attempt at uh, italic writing, it turns out that physics is local. Okay, meaning the types of Hamiltonians you'll see in nature, the time evolution in nature is also local. Okay, in the following sense. Okay, so which um, Hamiltonians do we see in nature? Right, and the answer is uh, local Hamiltonians. Okay, now let me define what that means. Okay. So this is definition 10. And this will be a k local Hamiltonian, where k will be a parameter that tells us the locality. And you should really think of, you know, just like we talk about k sat, where the clauses each had a uh, size k, right? A k local Hamiltonian will have quantum clauses now, and it, the clauses will each have size k. Okay, that's the basic idea. Okay, so what's the definition here? This is going to be a Hermitian operator. Um, operator H on n qubits. For example, I mean, I'm just giving you the space it acts on. Um, such that. Uh, the key property is that I could write it in this very nice way. Okay, so I could write it as um, the sum over all, I'm going to be very formal here, right? If you look in the literature, it'll be, they'll kind of drop some of this just because it's a little bit of a pain to write down, but the very first time, let me be formal. Okay, so what this is saying is that um, I'm going to look at all subsets of the set of qubits, right, of size precisely k. So here's that size parameter. Okay, and by the way, I'll give you some examples later, of course. And for each subset of size k, just like classically for each subset of k bits, we're going to put down a constraint. Um, potentially, of course, um, you could put down the zero constraint, which means you don't constrain those bits at all. Quantumly, we'll do the same thing. We'll put down a constraint on that subset s of qubits, h. Um, so here's your subset. So h will act on s. And now this is just acting on a subset s of qubits, just k qubits, but they're n qubits in total, right? So this thing cannot alone be a, an operator on all n qubits. I have to pad this thing with um, some other term so that the dimensions match, right? It's got to be 2 to the n by 2 to the n as an operator. And so since I don't want to constrain the rest of the system, the nice thing, the natural thing to do is put down an identity, OK? And here the identity is on kind of all the indices except that's a, a set minus operation, except the subset s. OK, so again, I'll give you some definitions, uh, examples in a second. But this is the, the formal definition of 
a local Hamiltonian. So just some clarifications, right? Um, H S acts non-trivially only on the qubits from S. Okay, so it's just like a, a classical clause that only acts on the a subset of bits now. And of course, by the way, so by the way, we do allow HS to be zero. So if you have a subset of qubits S where you don't want to constrain it, that's fine. You can put in the zero operator so that term effectively disappears from the Hamiltonian. This is okay. Okay, so the, the key terminology we're going to be using here is uh, lambda min of h. Okay, this is what we call the ground state energy. Okay, so what is this? Well, you know, h is just some Hermitian operator by definition, right? I mean, it has a, a particularly um, specific description, let's say, but it's still um, a Hermitian operator, so I can talk about its eigenvalues, and in particular, I could talk about its smallest eigenvalue, which is some real number. So that's physically motivated. I'll tell you that in a second. And the, okay, well, maybe I'll tell you that now, actually. So, so the basic idea is this, right? Um, I have this Hermitian operator H. This is what you see in the Schrodinger equation here, okay? And the key point here is that, uh, you know, if you look at this um, equation for a second, right? This is basically, um, like an, an eigenvalue equation, basically, right? Um, well, I mean, you've got, that's not entirely true. You've got psi times some unitary. Sorry, let me be a bit more clear. Now, if I choose my initial state psi to be uh, an eigenvector of this unitary, what's gonna happen? Well, nothing, right? I'm gonna pick up a phase. And in particular, what that means is that my quantum state then will remain unchanged, right? You're kind of stuck in this um, steady state, right? And so that's what the eigenvectors of kind of uh, this unitary and in turn, from your last um, your last assignment, you know that the eigenvectors of you know e to the minus i h t and h are the same, right? This exponentiation operation of e to the i um, t, right? That doesn't change the eigenvectors; it just changes the eigenvalues. So, if you think about you know physically what's happening here, you know if you happen to be one of the eigenstates of this operator h. That means that you're in one of the steady states of the system. Your system does not evolve in time, right? And um, at each of those kind of um, eigenvalues, right, you're going to be sitting at, um, well, you're going to have some corresponding eigenvalue, right? That's going to be the, the corresponding energy level of the system at that steady state, okay? Now, what happens, right, if you take your system and you kind of try and remove all the energy uh, from the system, right? In other words, you cool the system, right? And eventually, you know, this thing is going to settle into its lowest energy configuration. When that happens, right, uh, it turns out that the corresponding um, eigenvector you're going to be here is going to be uh, the eigenvector with the smallest eigenvalue of h. Okay, that eigenvector will be called the ground state. Okay, so this is, um, you know. I'm just going to write it like this for short, right? It's the eigenvector corresponding to the smallest eigenvalue of h. And that smallest eigenvalue itself is going to be the energy at uh, that configuration. Okay, lambda min is the ground state energy. Okay, so this is the sense in which um, studying local Hamiltonians, okay, is very physically motivated because, you know, it comes from the Schrodinger equation. It tells us about the steady states of the system. And in particular, it tells us about the ground state um, when we talk about the ground state energy. Okay. Now, why in the world should we care about the ground state, right? I mean, sure, you can define these things. Uh, the reason is because um, a lot of the cool stuff happens when you cool systems to low temperature. Okay, so kind of the, the very famous example is superfluid helium, right? If you take helium, which is a gas, right, normally, if you cool it uh, to um, really close, well, to low temperature, right? And typically low temperature for us will mean, you know, billions of a degree above absolute, absolute zero, okay, really cold. Then um, helium goes from being a gas to something called a superfluid. 
Okay, and once it enters a superfluid phase, it, it has a zero viscosity, right? It'd be, it, you know, I highly encourage you to pause this video right now and, you know, wholeheartedly procrastinate by uh, number one, going to YouTube and looking up, um, you know, superfluid helium and, and watching this video on that because it's awesome. And also uh, go to, um, well, where is it? Somewhere on Wikipedia, I found this at some point, right? Which is that, um, Uh, go to the Wikipedia page for absolute zero. Go see just how cold the coldest kind of uh, experiments uh, have been. Like how low have we gotten, how close to, to absolute zero can we get in the lab, right? It, it'll blow your mind, okay? After you're done procrastinating, come back, okay? And so um, that's essentially why we care about the ground state energy, right? Because, and the ground state, because, um, you know, we want to cool these systems to low temperatures so we can, um, you know, see these exotic properties like su superfluidity or superconductivity is another big one, right? But, you know, doing the experiments is very complicated, right? Um, you don't just stick your substance in a fridge, right? And then, you know, crank the temp thermostat down, right? It doesn't work that way, right? It's really, really complicated. Um, you really have to tailor this cooling experiment to your specific um, material that you have at hand. And so wouldn't it be nice if, you know, we could do this all theoretically, like at a mathematical level, like you give me the Hamiltonian for your system and I am able to kind of predict mathematically, analytically for you, um, what are the properties of the ground state? You know, just by kind of producing a description of the ground state and then um, reading, uh, reading off the properties, like when will it enter, say, uh, the superfluid phase, for example, things like this, okay? So that's why we care about K-local Hamiltonians. They show up in nature and why we care about their ground states. Okay. By the way, uh, if you're wondering, you know, I, I can't have a course about quantum anything and not tell you about this, right? Even though it's strictly not necessary. Um, one of the reasons why it's called quantum mechanics, right? Quantum comes from quantized, right? Um, so that means that even though we work in this continuous space, state space, right? Uh, states are live in C2 to the N, right? Nevertheless, the set of energy levels you see in the Schrodinger equation are not continuous, right? Absolutely not, right? They're discrete they correspond to the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this operator, okay? Um, which for us are going to be a, a finite discrete set. We're working in finite dimensions, right? So, so that's one of the reasons why we call it quantum mechanics, okay? Good. Da, 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 da. So it's possible to embed, by the way, um, maybe I'll, let's see how much time has gone by. We've used almost an hour up. Maybe, uh, you know, I, I guess it's worth seeing this because otherwise um, you might lose some of the intuition as to, you know, how do we think about these local Hamiltonian systems? First, by the way, sorry, I promised you some examples. So let me give you some examples, All right? So here is an example of, oh, so by the way, before I give the example, this is a two to the N by two to the N operator, right? It's huge. We can't write this thing down, but, this thing, right, acts only on k qubits. So it's really only 2 to the k by 2 to the k, okay? So if k is small, say if k is a constant, which is what we're going to think of it as, then this term here, right, is only a constant size matrix. I can certainly describe that thing, right? And how many terms do I have in total? Well, I have at most um, n, basically, and how big is each subset k? So I have at most n choose k terms, right? That scales roughly as, you know, n to the power k, some polynomial in n. So what this means is that a local Hamiltonian, unlike the case of a general Hamiltonian, it has a succinct classical description, okay? So that's kind of amazing, right? Because normally I cannot hope to write these things down. They're just too big. But for the kinds of Hamiltonians we see in nature, these local Hamiltonians, those do have efficient classical descriptions. I can hope to, I can write this side of the equation down, right? I can't explicitly expand it out to get the left side, but I can write down the right side. So here, you know, there's a sense in which nature, you know, we, we catch a break, right? Nature's nice to us. We can at least describe this thing. But of course, the point of today's lecture as a whole will be that nevertheless, computing properties of this Hamiltonian is going to be hard. It's going to be QMA hard. And in particular, uh, computing this ground state energy, right, one of these very natural properties that you'll, you'd probably learn about in like first or second semester quantum mechanics, 
um, as in, in terms of what a physicist would learn, right? That property is hard to estimate in general. Okay, so now come the long um, promised examples. So here's an example of a two local Hamiltonian. So all I've done is I have two qubits, um, right? Qubits one and two, I can uh, visualize them this way. And here what's going on is that I have an operator Z tensor Z which acts on one and two, okay? Z is just Pauli Z. Here's a slightly more complicated one. I can imagine now I have a four qubit system. One, two, three, four. And by the way, I'm drawing these systems as if they're arranged on a line, but that does not have to be the case. And here I could have, sorry, so here I have a constraint, an edge will be a constraint. So here I could have um, four constraints, or sorry, three constraints, one here, one here, one here, right? So three edges. The first constraint is going to be, um, you know, I'll have a Z tensor Z here on these two. And then I'll have a Z tensor Z on these two. And finally, I'll also put a Z tensor Z on these two. Okay, so those are just two local constraints. And the way I formally write this down is, you know, let me, I'm gonna write it out fully. The first constraint is this one, right? Z1 tensor Z2, it just acts on qubits one and two. To be very formal for now, I'm just going to write explicitly that on the last two qubits, I'm not doing anything, right? So I just put an identity down. The second middle constraint has an identity on the first qubit. It has a Z on the second qubit a Z on the third qubit and an identity on the fourth qubit. That's this one. And finally, I have the third term, which is identity on the first two qubits. Okay. And a Z on the third and the fourth qubit. Okay. So that's the formal operator. Typically now when we describe these things, we're just going to, you know, to kind of maintain sanity, we're going to ignore these identity parts and you know, we're just going to write, you know, Z1 tensor Z2 plus Z, Z2 tensor Z3 and so forth um, with the understanding that there's an implicit identity of a else. Okay. So that those are examples of, you know, two local Hamiltonians and in particular, these ones act on a line, okay, which is a very popular type of system to study. Okay. So... So let's very quickly talk about now how we can embed 3SAT into the ground state energy of a local Hamiltonian. Okay, so why is estimating the ground state energy going to be at least MP hard? Okay, so how to encode uh, three, let's say 3SAT, doesn't really matter, but let's say 3SAT into, or let me say more generally KSAT because I'm going to talk about 2SAT here, but the same trick holds generally into the ground state energies of local Hamiltonians. Okay, so what do we do? Suppose, I'm just gonna do it by example, okay, in the interest of time. Suppose I have a clause, a 2SAT clause. Again, 2SAT is not uh, MP-hard in general, but you know, it doesn't matter. The same construction works for 3SAT. Okay. So um, suppose I had a two-set clause, I'm just going to call it C equals to X1 or the negation of X2. Okay, how do I encode this into uh, a constraint on two qubits uh, like this one, for example? This is a two-qubit constraint, right? Z1 tensor Z2. How do I encode that? Well, here's the basic idea, right? So first we start by, you know, let me define H. This is just for a single um, Maybe, uh, let's be clear, this is for a bit one and two. So, um, okay, this is for a bit uh, one and two. So therefore, I'm gonna define a Hermitian operator on a Hamiltonian on qubits one and two. So this is gonna be four by four, right? Because it's, it's a two qubit operator. And what's the idea? Well, the basic idea is simple, right? I look at this clause and think about what is the set of satisfying versus unsatisfying assignments, okay? And the way we do this in physics, and I, I, I use the term uh, we loosely here because I don't consider myself a physicist, of course, is that um, we kind of work backwards to the classical setting, right? So classically here, um, the goal is to kind of maximize the number of clauses we satisfy. And in physics, because we're talking about ground state energies, we're trying to minimize things, we kind of flip everything upside down, right? We instead talk about what are the bad assignments and we try and avoid those rather than trying to kind of um, go towards the good assignments. 
Okay, so what is the bad assignment here? There's only one bad assignment, right? Because it's uh, in CNF form, right? So the unique bad assignment is what? Well, the only way you fail this is, well, you have to set x1 to false, right? And you have to set x2 to true. This is the only bad assignment there is. All the other three assignments on these two bits are satisfying. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my 4x4 four four matrix. I'm going to label its rows and columns by you know, the, the bit strings, right? Because it's a four-dimensional matrix, I can do this. And the name of the game is going to be whatever the bad assignment is, on that diagonal entry, I'm going to give you an energy penalty. Okay, So the bad assignment here is 0, 1. Right? So here I'm going to put um, a 1. That's your energy penalty because that's the bad assignment. That assignment I want to penalize. So I don't want that to go. Uh, I want that to be a high energy configuration. That's the idea. And everywhere else, all the other assignments are satisfying. So I want to make those small. Okay, I want those to. So I mean, if you okay, if you look at this thing, right? One is one of the eigenvalues of this matrix. It's diagonal, and the other three eigenvalues are zero. And remember, our goal is to look for the ground state energy, the smallest eigenvalue. Okay, so if you want to live in that ground space here, you want to pick one of these three assignments: zero, zero, one, zero, one, one. This one is bad. It's going to push you up into a higher eigenvalue space. That's the intuition. Okay. And so um, the way this works now is that observe that you know if I take any um, x now, just a, a pair of bits x1, x2, right? Then um, what do I have? Well, if I do this, if I do x h12 x, right? What is this? Well, um, this is just you know if I let me just write this out fully. It's x12 right? The the bits of that x12 right? Oops. Right. What is this going to do? It's going to remember this is just. Um, going to extract kind of this row and this column, right? So um, this is going to therefore equal to, um, so this is going to be basically the entry at row and column. It's going to match because the left and the right sides match. Um, x1, x2, x1, x2. Sorry, I should say at position more accurately, right? This is the position we're at, OK? So in other words, that means that um, this thing is equal to 0 if uh, c of x1, x2 is equal to 1. So if you satisfy the clause, that means that you're going to be looking up one of these three entries. right? And otherwise, if you fail the clause, sorry, this was supposed to be c. Bit of a monstrosity there. Okay. If, you, if your assignment x1, x2 fails the clause, right? it's the only bad assignment. Right, then the, the index you're going to look up is this one, right? It's, it's row, column, 0, 1, 0, 1. OK? And so um, this is just for one clause. When we do this, therefore, the, you know, the ground space of this one clause is going to be the span of you know, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1. OK, so, so the ground space of h12 is equal to the span of 0, 0. 0, 1, 1, uh, sorry, not 0, 1. 0, 1 is the bad one, right? 1, 0, 1, 1. OK, it's just uh, this one, this one, this one, right? We want to avoid the one space. OK, so that's the name of the game. That's This is uh, basically how you do the encoding. And this is just for one clause, right? I did this for, let's say, on um, bits 1 and 2. I can, of course, generalize, uh, not generalize, but I could now do this for multiple clauses, right? So for each clause, you do the same thing, right? This is one two local term, and then you add them all together, right? To get this big local Hamiltonian with uh, sums of local terms. It's the same idea. OK, so um, you know, just to be uh, explicit, right? Um, so for example, uh, let's uh, put clause, the same clause C, um, C12 also on uh, qubits 
say, I don't know, I'm just gonna make something up, three, four, right? So then my total Hamiltonian would look like this. It would be like uh, H12, right? That's just what I had up here. Tensor identity on three, four, plus identity on one, two now. And I could put the same, um, this is, by the way, uh, this is really just H12, they're the same operator, okay? I'm just indexing it three, four. So I can use reuse the same operator because we're in this example, I'm encoding the exact same clause, right? On now qubits three, four. And this is what my two local Hamiltonian H would now look like, okay? Okay, and so exercise 16, um, so there are a few exercises here which I strongly recommend you to work through. Exercise 16 now argues that, um, you know, this operator, you're gonna be in the null space of this operator if you give me an assignment um, and it corresponds to a string. Um, so let me just write down the exercise and Right, and now uh, what this says is that um, prove that x for x is now a four bit string, right? Because there are four qubits in my system, satisfies um, x of h x equals zero if and only if, right? Uh, how do I do this here? Da -da 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 -da. Um, X satisfies, you know, the clause uh, on one, two, and the same clause on three, four. Okay, so prove this to yourself. So this is why soundness would hold in this reduction, right? Because it says that, uh, you know, if there was a satisfying assignment for the clause, then I could all simulate that on this uh, funny Hamiltonian I built by just setting my quantum state to the string that is the satisfying assignment. And um, Exercise 17, which I won't go through here, but exercise 17 um, essentially asks you to show soundness, right? And the problem here is that, you know, everything I've done so far, right, uh, when I've talked about, you know, x, h, x, right, um, when I've talked about the energy obtained by the state x, I've always assumed that x was a classical string, right, because I encoded, uh, you know, this classical diagonal Hamiltonian, right? But of course, in general, now I'm in the quantum world, right? So if I want to talk about the, the true lowest eigenvalue of, you know, this, this sum of all the terms, um, this H, this Hamiltonian, I have to allow, you know, the, the ground state to be any state. It does, it's not necessarily a string, right? It's, it can be a, a genuinely entangled quantum state. And so now you need to prove that even if I allow you to use quantum states, basically the smallest eigenvalue of this operator H is still going to, without loss of generality, correspond to an eigenvector, which is a string. Okay, you can never do better than the classical string. Okay. Now the easiest way to see this, by the way, so okay, prove that uh, without loss of generality, the the ground state. So from now on, this means ground state. Psi um, is uh, just a classical string. Okay, so it's a standard basis state. So why is this true? Well, you know, intuitively, look at this thing, right? All my constraints were diagonal in the standard basis, by definition, right? And when I added them together, I just tensored with the identity, which is also diagonal. So each of these terms is now diagonal. So now I'm adding all these terms, each is diagonal. So of course, when I add diagonal terms, I still get one big gigantic diagonal matrix H, right? My Hamiltonian is huge, but it's just a diagonal matrix. And while a diagonal matrix always diagonalizes, by definition, it's already diagonal, right? In the basis you've just written it down in, right? Which in our case is the standard basis, right? I labeled um, the rows and columns by the standard basis, right? So this is the standard basis. So by definition, you know, I'm diagonalizable in the standard basis, which means that all my eigenvectors without loss of generality can be chosen to be in the standard basis. That's essentially the answer to exercise 17. Okay. So more generally, of course, the Hamiltonians we write down over here, um, they won't necessarily be diagonal, right? I mean, that's just in the classical case, but when you move to the generally quantum case now, um, your Hamiltonians will not be diagonal anymore. So, you know, this is not in the notes, but um, you might think about something like this, right? Where um, you have local terms hij now of the form, you know, you can put down these Pauli uh, operators, for example, xi tensor xj plus yi tensor yj. 
um, on every pair of qubits where you want to put a constraint. You can do this, right? And this is certainly not diagonal anymore. Okay, so here now, the optimal solution, the ground state, will no longer be a string. It'll be some uh, fancy entangled state. Okay, so now let's take a brief moment to recap as to what we've done so far, right? Uh, we reviewed the classical cook levin theorem. We defined local Hamiltonians. We motivated them physically in terms of their ground state energy. And remember, this is kind of the main thing we'll be interested in, which we'll define formally in a second, by the way. <clears throat> the actual uh, kind of quantum sat problem we haven't defined yet. And uh, finally, we sketched quickly how you can embed you know, clauses for, say, 2SAT or 3SAT into local Hamiltonian constraints. And therefore, that um, <clears throat> using that idea, one can show that um, estimating the ground state energy of a local Hamiltonian will be at least NP-hard. Okay, so now we can talk about the quantum Cook-Levin theorem. For that, I need to formally define the problem that we're going to claim as QMA-hard. It will have to do with estimating ground state energies, but let's be formal about it because we will talk a fair bit about it. So this is definition 20, k local Hamiltonian. <clears throat> Hamiltonian problem. Okay, for short, just KLH. And the idea here is what? So you fix a polynomial, <clears throat> P. Okay, and now remember that in this course we deal with promise problems and in particular KLH is a promise problem. Okay, and so what's the input? Right, the input will be number one, a K local Hamiltonian. H, right? And again, this is the sum of local terms. So S is just subsets, just like before. And uh, this is going to be some Hermitian operator, and it acts on you know, some n qubit system. Okay, so I just have some local Hamiltonian. You describe the local terms of HS for me. That tells me everything I need to know. And the other thing I need is uh, threshold functions, which, of course, I'm going to assume are efficiently computable. Um, alpha of n, beta of n, and generally we're going to, um, well, okay, normally of course you would treat the input size as, um, you know, the number of bits you needed to describe, you know, h and alpha beta. Typically what ends up happening in, um, you know, the more physically motivated setting is that the the input size is often thought instead as, as the number of qubits that you act on. Um, that's not always the case, it depends on uh, the context uh, you're working on you're working in, but you know, typically in this course, um, n is representative of you know the true input size. Okay, so you know number of qubits is kind of the, the main parameter we'll have in mind. Okay. Okay, um, this is what starts happening when you play in physics world rather than uh, computer science world, right? Okay, so you have two threshold functions, alpha and beta. These are just going to be real numbers, basically, um, and they're supposed they satisfy a promise gap. Uh, sorry, I want the absolute value of these two. Will always be at least one over polynomial in n. Okay, so the whole idea is that there's some inverse polynomial gap between these two. Okay, so my input to reiterate is what? It's going to be uh, a local Hamiltonian and some sort of threshold functions, alpha and beta, which are not too close together. And the whole idea here is that, you know, I want to encode this idea of estimating the ground state energy, the smallest eigenvalue of H. Of course, I can't do that because I want to talk about decision problems. And so, like yes-no problems. And so I have to turn uh, this into a, a yes-no type setting, right? So the output, if the smallest eigenvalue of H is small, meaning, you know, it's smaller than alpha, right? And here, I'm, I'm not going to bother writing N all the time. I'll just write alpha from now on then we want to accept or output yes. Okay, so that's supposed to be uh, what your machine is supposed to do. So if on the other hand, the smallest eigenvalue h is large, so it's at least beta, right? Then you want to reject, okay? And keep in mind here that alpha and beta are uh, inverse polynomially separated. Okay, so you can think of it this way. So here's alpha, 
here's beta, right? Here's your promise gap, basically. This is what we call the promise gap, right? Because, um, you know, in the S case, so this is, of course, the S case. This is the no case. In the S case, you're down here, right? Your, your ground state energy is small, just like we had with the SAT formula in being embedded into local Hamiltonian terms. In the no case, your ground state energy is large, right? And, well, maybe I shouldn't, well, okay, let me be very precise about it. And if you don't satisfy this promise, right? So if this thing is strictly in the range of alpha to beta, okay, um, then you can do whatever you feel like, right? It doesn't matter. You violated the promise of the problem. So uh, as, a, as a person solving, uh, you know, your problem, I don't have to fulfill any contractual obligations. Okay, so, that, so that's this, this area here. Okay, so intuitively this is, here's the reason why we care about promise problems in this course, right? I mean, look at this thing, right? If I give you a local Hamiltonian H and I give you some thresholds, right? How in the world do you check, right? That indeed the smallest eigenvalue of H is, you know, um, not in this range, right? There's no way to efficiently check that, right? So the only thing we can do is, you know, we have to kind of like abstract that out and say, okay, well, that's going to be a promise, right? I'm going to promise you that the smallest eigenvalue is not there. Okay, there's no way for me to verify that myself. This is intuitively why we, we need to deal with the framework of promise problems. Okay, that's the local Hamiltonian problem. Okay, that's it. I give you a local Hamiltonian, exponentially large matrix, um, and I give you some, you know, thresholds, alpha small, beta is big, and I ask you, you know, is the small stacking value small, smaller than alpha, or at least uh, B beta bigger than beta, okay? And of course, normally, if you want to solve um, eigenvalue problems, you can certainly solve these efficiently in time polynomial in the dimension of the matrix, right? I mean, we know how to diagonalize matrices uh, say on your computer, right? Numerically, but the problem here is that um, this matrix is huge, right? It's two to the power n by two to the power n. So those algorithms will run way too long. And I've given you succinct encoding, right? So your encoding size is polylogarithmic in the dimension. Okay, so, so that's the catch, right? It's just a linear algebra problem, right? It's just small sign value, but you can't even write the full matrix out explicitly. So you certainly can't solve it efficiently. Okay, so that is the problem. Um, this promise gap between alpha and beta, this is one over poly, right? Of the input size or say the number of qubits. Uh, that's important, right? If you make that thing smaller, say one over exponential, then this problem becomes P space complete, for example, okay? So now let me just state the quantum Cook-Levin theorem, right? Now that we've defined the problem efficient, uh, formally, Cook-Levin theorem. Okay, and you know, the, the probably the appropriate name to give this thing in some sense is, uh, you know, this is not formally done in the field, but you know, if you ask me, it should probably be called the uh, Kitaev-Feynman uh, theorem. And the reason why, although, okay, that's not uh, true, sorry, I take that back. You know, people call this Kitaev-Feynman or Feynman-Kitaev construction all the time. I guess you want, want to put Feynman first. Um, because um, well, alphabetically comes first. And the, the construction is based on ideas from a Feynman, actually, um, who had this idea of coupling a clock register to simulate universal uh, computation on a quantum computer. Um, and it was Kitaev who realized that these ideas uh, could be used in a very clever way, basically, to show that this k-local Hamiltonian problem is hard for quantum ink. Okay, so um, maybe I should swap these around, you know. This construction in this theorem is often called the feynman kitaev uh, circuit to Hamiltonian construction. So here's the theorem. The theorem is basic state. It says, um, essentially, the five uh, local Hamiltonian problem, okay, so all the constraints now act on five qubits at a time, is a QMA complete. That's the basic statement of the theorem. Of course, technically speaking, you know, if you really want to be precise, uh, which we normally do, but it's just that today's lecture is long, uh, so I'm going to have to sacrifice something. Uh, this polynomial, there's, you know, you fix, there's some polynomial P for which this problem is hard, right? Some gap size, right, for which this problem is hard. So if your gap size is at most that large, we know the problem is certainly hard in the worst case. Okay, so this is the theorem we want to show in the rest of the lecture. It is the quantum Cook-Levin theorem.
It, number one, gives us a quantum analog of MP completeness. Okay, so now we can go ahead and start thinking of um, physically motivated problems as being hard, computationally speaking, for, say, a QMA. And uh, number two, remember this shows that, uh, indeed, this intuition that Feynman had and many others that um, quantum systems are hard to study, um, indeed, that's true. And here's kind of a rigorous proof. Assuming QMA is not equal to BQP, which most people uh, believe is true, uh, it, it shows that a physically motivated property, calculating these low, um, these, um, the ground state energy, right, that is going to be hard for QMA. Okay, it's going to be impossible or intractable in general. Okay? Okay. So remember, QMA completeness requires two things, right? We want to show that um, five local Hamiltonian first is in QMA, so that's your upper bound. And then you want to show that this thing is QMA hard. Okay, so two things because it's, we're talking about completeness. So I'm going to start with uh, containment in QMA because that's the easier one. And I'll just sketch this idea. There's a bit more of a discussion in the notes. But let's talk about containment in QMA. Okay. So here's the very basic idea, right? Um, so remember in QMA, we have a, a quantum verifier, right? Here it is. So it's some circuit that you can produce based on the input size, right? And it gets kind of the, the input to the problem, and it gets a proof, psi, right? So this is my input, this is the proof. And it does some polynomial time quantum computation, and it outputs a single bit, which will measure and then um, accept if we get a one, right? That's the basic idea for QMA. And um, in the yes case, of course, um, so for example, intuitively, let's go back to this thing. To show this thing is in QMA, in the S case, you need to be able to convince me that the smallest energy is smaller than alpha. In the no case, you have to prove to me that the smallest eigenvalue is at least beta. Oh, sorry, you don't have to prove it to me, sorry. Um, the smallest eigenvalue is at least beta, right? Remember, it's a one-sided definition because we only need to prove something in the S case in, in QMA, okay? Um, so how do you prove to me that the eigenvalue is small in the S case? Well, intuitively, it, it's kind of obvious, right? You just give me the eigenvector for that eigenvalue, right? And classically, once you give me the eigenvector, then I could just do matrix multiplication and see that the eigenvalue is smaller than alpha. But quantumly, of course, I don't have that luxury because I cannot write out the full matrix, it's just too big. So instead, of course, the eigenvector you'll give me will be a quantum state, okay? Okay, so, um, so the idea, so the idea, is the, the proof psi is the ground state. Okay, that's the basic idea. Okay, such that, um, you know, um, h psi equals to lambda min psi. And lambda min from now on is just going to mean um, the smallest eigenvalue of h. Of course, a cheating prover does not have to give me this eigenvector. They can give me any state, but we'll see in a second that that doesn't really matter. Okay, so, so here's kind of the analysis, right? We're just going to sketch it, right? So we have to prove that uh, we can verify an instance of, um, of the local Hamiltonian problem. So imagine you have any proof, psi, right? And what I want to do, um, Okay, what I want to do is that um, I want to um, okay so let's um, recall right that um, by the courant Fisher uh, formula this variational characterization of eigenvalues that uh, lambda min is equal to what it equals to uh, the minimum over all unit vectors, uh, psi of psi h psi, right? That that's um, what the ground state energy is. It's just the, the optimum of this, right? So if I want to check that you've given me this the smallest energy eigenvector, you know, I could just simulate. Um, I could try to you know you give me psi as a quantum state, and I try and estimate that um, this expectation value. Okay, so um, so my goal is to estimate. 
uh, and this is of course once you've given me psi, uh, the trace of h, right, psi psi. Right, so you give me the state, uh, this is what you give me as density operator, and, and now the thing is that keep in mind that this guy is Hermitian, right? And so I can think of it as an observable. Right? By definition, any Hermitian operator is an observable. I can just diagonalize it and imagine that I'm just doing a, a, a measurement in the basis for that observable, right? where the eigenvalues are going to be um, kind of the value you get when you get a certain measurement outcome. Okay, So that's, in principle, a measurement that uh, quantum mechanics allows. Uh, the only problem is that I cannot um, measure all of H simultaneously, right? because intuitively this thing is acting on n qubits so in order to measure in the eigenbasis of h i would need to rotate the entire space over into the standard basis and that could be a very expensive rotation so the insight is that um, the trace of h psi psi right what is that really well that's just the sum over all the subsets of the trace of h s right psi psi Right? Because remember, h just equals to the sum over s of hs. That's just a local term. So instead of measuring the full thing at one time, I could imagine measuring each one locally. Right? This is the idea. And you know, this measurement I could certainly do. Why? Because this is a, a 2 to the k by 2 to the k matrix. Um, you know, throughout, we're assuming k is a constant. Right? So this is just some constant size matrix. If I want to me um, do a measurement in the eigenbase of this thing, well, it's trivial for me to write down a constant size unitary essentially that will rotate um, me um, rotate between the standard basis and the eigenbasis of HS basically. Okay, so this measurement for each HS I could do that measurement. Okay, now there's a slight problem which is that you know ideally what you'd want to do is that you'd want to do each of these measurements HS. Um, so for each S you do the measurement many times and you you collect uh, measurement statistics right. Uh, this thing would be the expectation of that measurement of course because it's the trace. But of course, I only have one copy of the proof psi. I cannot, um, well, OK, you could do that, I suppose. But we don't need to um, go to that extreme, it turns out. Right, what we instead do, so the actual verification, how do we verify this thing in uh, QMA, is the following. I'm not actually going to check all the HS. Right? I mean, I could do that if I wanted to, and then I'd get many copies of the proof. Um, but instead, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to pick HS uh, uniformly at random. So I have some set of these um, local constraints, right? So I'll just pick one of them and I'll measure that one. You measure with respect to HS. Okay, that's it. So what is the expectation value of this thing, of this procedure, right? Well, the expectation value is what? It's the sum over all the events we could have. So the sum over all the subsets I could have chosen, right? The probability of picking that particular subset, right? And then once I pick that subset, uh, what is the value I get, right? And the value of the measurement, the expected value of this measurement is nothing other than uh, psi hs psi. Okay, this is the the expectation of this sampling experiment where I pick one of these guys at random and then I measure that one. Right? On average, this is what I would get. Okay, and now um, let's assume there are uh, m terms hs henceforth. Okay, so m little m will always mean the number of local terms. Then I could just rewrite this thing as what I could well rewrite it as um, 1 over m, right, because that's just the probability of picking any one particular one. There are m of them, right? Um, sorry, I should have this thing, yeah, sum over s of psi hs psi, right? So all I did is I just substituted in the probability of picking any one particular set s. And now I can move the sum in, right? This is just 1 over m psi h psi. Right, and here I just use the fact that h equals to the sum over s hs. Okay. So if I do this sampling experiment where I randomly pick a local term and I just measure it, kind of the simplest thing you could uh, think of doing, right? Um, 
that is going to be enough to do the QMA verification, it turns out, right? Um, the exact value, um, sorry, the ex expected value of this procedure will be not exactly what we want, right? We wanted um, this thing, right? This was our goal, remember? Our goal was to estimate this, the energy of the state psi that you gave me against H. And we won't get that exactly. We're going to get the same thing, but up to this one over M term, right? But, you know, M is some polynomial. And remember, I have a polynomial gap uh, between my yes and no instances, right? Alpha and beta over here. These thresholds, um, they were separated by a one over poly gap, you know, so um, polynomials are not a problem, basically, right? Okay, so in particular, um, what do we conclude, right, of this experiment, right? Um, in expectation, this experiment yields what? Okay, so this is an experiment. We could do it, right? What will we get? Well, we have to analyze yes and no case separately, right? In the yes case, what you do, the prover will send uh, the ground state, the true ground state, the GS is a ground state, psi, okay, uh, let me just call it lambda min, uh, psi min for now. And then therefore um, we get the expectation um, one over M psi min, H psi min, right? That's the expected value of this um, thing. And I know from the promise of the problem, right, that in the S case, you know, this quantity is at most alpha, right? So in the S case, we know that your, your ground state energy is at most alpha. Okay, so in the S case, this is the threshold we get. On average, we expect to see a, a value that will be at most alpha over M. How about the no case? And now I can't assume, of course, psi is any particular state. Well, what do I know is that for any um, psi, we know what? Well, we know that um, the expectation is again the same thing, like that the starting expression does not change. Expectation is a one over M psi H psi, right? That's what the experiment gave us. What is this? This is at least one over M times lambda min of H. Right? And this is just, uh, again, because of this koan fischer formula, right? The, the minimum of this expression here is always given by the smallest eigenvector. Anything else can only be bigger. So it's at least lambda min. And I know that in this case, lambda min is at least beta, right? That was just uh, the promise um, of the no case, right? The smallest eigenvalue is at least beta. And so uh, this is by koan fischer Okay, and so we see a gap, right? In the yes case, the my expected value is at most alpha over m. Here's over here. In the no case, my expected value is at least beta over m. Okay, and alpha is um, polynomially smaller than beta, so we certainly will have a one over poly gap here. And you know that's at least the intuition, right? Um, to make this fully fully formal, I mean this is about expectation, right? And remember, in QMA, technically speaking, expectation is not good enough, right? Um, if we go back to this verifier view, right? Here we want to say that in the S case, when you give me the ground state, I'm going to accept with some probability, like uh, probably at least two thirds, right? It's not a statement about expectation, right? So what's left is to take this statement about expectation, right? We have these bounds on expectation and convert it to a high probability statement, right? So that with high probability in the S case, you will output um, one, for example, okay? And I'm not gonna go through that uh, through that in uh, serious detail, but let me just sort of sketch how this goes. So to convert um, statement about expected value value to um, probability to a high probability statement, right? And so. I mean, again, remember that this is important, right? Because you could have something like, um, imagine you had a, a distribution, right? Which was just uniform, right? It's just some flat distribution. It's really long and wide. Um, and then the expectation um, of this thing is right here. It's right in the middle. Let's just say it's zero, right? 
but you know the odds of you being kind of really close to zero let's say will be very very small right this thing is really thin and, and widely spread out right so we really wanted to have a high probability statement to say that uh, not only is this expectation satisfy kind of some nice bounds um, that with high probability in fact um, we'll be able to accept in the yes case we'll be able to say yes the energy really is at most alpha over m or something like this okay okay so um what we use is, at least in these notes, is something called the Hüfting bound. It's very similar to the Chernoff bound. Okay, and basically, um, this is just worth knowing in its own right. So all I'm really gonna do is I'm gonna state the bound here and then I'll let you kind of play with how you would apply it. But basically, it's gonna allow us to um, show that if um, we repeat an experiment uh, n times in parallel, uh, well, independently, basically, and then we kind of take an average of the results, you know, with very high probability, we'll be close to um, the true expected value of um, the random variable we wanted to simulate. Okay? So, you know, let me be slightly more formal here. So let uh, omega subset of R um, be our sample space. Okay? So um, for us, this just means that um, So if I'm doing a, a local measurement on HS, then you know the sample space will be um, the eigenvalues there of HS. Da, 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 da. Well, maybe I, I won't go through all this in extreme detail. Okay, no, let's just write. Okay, so let um, XI in the sample space, right, be a random variable. Um, corresponding, well, these aren't eigenvalues really, sorry. Um, this is really going to be, uh, well, okay, eigen, yes, yeah, sorry, they will be eigenvalues because we're, these are going to be the, we're measuring an observable, right, and so the eigenvalues will be the labels you get when you do the measurement, right? So this is going to be the, the random variable corresponding to, um, where are we? Measurement outcome. of the ith run, so i is just, you know, this indicator here, of uh, the verifier v, okay? And of course, this is given psi, right? So you give me a copy of the proof psi, and, you know, I run the verifier, and, you know, we repeat this game many times, and each time I get a measurement outcome xi, okay? And And what do we do, right? Um, so ideally I want to do, you know, one over m times, I, I have this kind of quantity. Um, what do I do now is I take all these runs, right? And I take their average, right? Because I'm trying to estimate the true expectation value of this measurement. Uh, the true expectation would have been, um, is psi um, h psi, right? You give me the state psi, I do this measurement. So I can't really do that. So instead what I'll do is I'll do many uh, local measurements and I will, take their average and hope that this approaches the true expectation sufficiently quickly. So this thing, and then I will divide through by n, okay? And, and now the, the question is just this, right? Um, suppose I have an experiment where I know that this is the true expectation, right? And I'm only able to um, you know, take samples from this thing, from this distribution, basically. And then I want to know, if I take many samples and I kind of add them up and I divide through uh, by the total number of samples, so I take kind of like the usual notion of average that we might think of, this arithmetic mean, um, how quickly does this approach, you know, the, the real expectation? That's what the Hifting bound allows us to bound. It shows us that this happens with very high probability. Um, okay, and of course the trials are independent here. Let me be clear. Right, so this holds whenever you have independent um, IID trials, basically. And so what does the Hüfting bound say? So in its most, uh, I guess in its rather general form, as long as this 
each variable, you know, you have some bounds on where it can lie. So for us, uh, we know what a, i, and b, i um, will be. Like for each of the local terms, I know the eigenvalues, so I know how big or small they could be. Um, so if, for all i, you know how big or small your, the values your variable can take on, right? Then here's what we care about, right? What is the probability that, you know, the quantity i compute, that's this one, okay, this arithmetic mean, what is the probability that that deviates from the true expectation of A? Okay? And, you know, to formalize this, maybe, you know, you'll specify some kind of deviation amount. Let's just call it T, right? So the bigger T gets, the bigger I'm deviating from the true expectation E of A. And, of course, now I want to upper bound this probability by something that scales nicely with T. So the bigger T gets, the probability of me deviating by that much should be rather small. Okay, and indeed it is really small. It looks like this, it's two to the minus um, two. Okay, let me just put down the important parameters here. Here's a square, a square, sum over all i equals one up to n of bi minus ai squared. Okay. So the point here is just that um, you know this quantity here, roughly speaking, is decreasing very quickly, right? With two things, right? Number one, the number of trials. So as we blow up the number of trials, this thing will the probability of you failing basically will um, decay exponentially. And the other one is with t, right? If you're asking, you know, what are the odds that I'm really far from the expected value? Well, you know, those odds will drop exponentially quickly. Okay. So in our setup, you know, think about each of these xi's as being like a, a measurement basically for one of the local hs's, like this is going to be your observable. The outcomes would be, you know, the eigenvalues, um, for example, of hs, because those are the labels of the projective measurement, right? And then you could talk about, you know, kind of this average when you repeat this uh, experiment many, many times, and then you want to know, uh, and then you could bound that, okay, I know my expectation uh, in the s case is at most this, and in the no case, uh, at least this, right? And so now you want to argue that with high probability, if I kind of repeat these measurements, this this thing over here, where was my um, this this latest thing, greatest, most awesome measurement experiment, where I just pick a local term HS at random, I just measure and I rinse and repeat. If I keep doing this over and over again, and then I kind of um, add all the values I get and I renormalize, basically, uh, take an arithmetic mean, I will approach the true expectation. Um, this thing here, psi h psi, uh, very, very quickly, right? And so, you know, I'll be very, very close. My additive error to that will be very small so that I can distinguish between, you know, is the, the true expectation at most alpha over m or at least beta over m, right? So in particular, notice that if I want to distinguish between alpha over m and beta over m, these guys are inverse polynomially separated. So the error I can tolerate in estimating this expectation is 1 over poly, right? Some sufficiently small 1 over poly. So what does that mean? That means that in this uh, hefting bound, right, what are the odds that um, the kind of deviation I could tolerate is 1 over poly here? t can be 1 over poly. And this is kind of nice, right? Because uh, here, if t is 1 over poly, then that means that by making n, the number of trials, a sufficiently big polynomial, then I could kind of outweigh this t and drive this whole expectation down to 0 very, very quickly. OK? So that's the way you should think about these uh, hoofding bounds, for example. OK. So this is how we show, basically, that um, the local Hamiltonian problem is in QMA. Right? You basically repeat this very simple sampling experiment. You pick a random uh, local term. You measure um, the proof with that. And you rinse and repeat. Right? You imagine take many copies of the proof in. Okay? And uh, due to the hoofding bound, because these are all um, independent trials, basically, um, we're going to converge to the expected value of this sampling experiment exponentially quickly in the number of trials. Okay, and here we are really, really, really leveraging the fact that um, the input promise gap between alpha and beta in the local Hamiltonian problem was 1 over poly. Right? If back in this definition, if alpha and beta, this gap over here, if this promise gap is not 1 over poly, then the sampling experiment doesn't work, right? The number of trials you would need to get 
to distinguish these two, if this was exponentially small, the number of trials would also have to be exponential. Okay? And that's why you would no longer be in QMA intuitively. Right? It turns out it's actually P space hard in that P space hard in that case, but this is why you don't expect it to be in QMA to begin with. Okay, so then in the Hoefding bound, if you have an exponentially small precision, then T is one over exponential. Uh, so in order to weigh out a one over exponential, N would have to be huge. It would have to be exponential, the number of trials. Okay, so that um, allows us to see the local Hamiltonian problem is in QMA. Okay, so it's just a sketch, of course. And now we want to talk about QMA hardness. Okay. And so let me be clear that in the previous setting, so KLH is in QMA for any, technically that trick will work for any, even logarithmic local is fine too, right? Because then the, the local terms HS will be polynomial in size. But for hardness, you know, we really want to get this locality parameter down as much as we can, okay? And this is lemma 30, which states that uh, the K local Hamiltonian problem is QMA hard. And maybe I'll be a little bit more precise here under poly time, many one reductions. for k at least 5. At least this, this is the original theorem of uh, Kitaev, basically. So it's hard as long as the, the local Hamiltonian terms are allowed to be 5 local. Okay, so they act on 5 qubits at a time. Since then, you know, there's been a ton of work to improve this um, parameter here, right? So first of all, if everything is 1 local, I'll let you think about it, but 1 local is easy. Like certainly um, you could always solve the local Hamiltonian problem when each of the Hamiltonian terms just act on one qubit at a time. Okay, that's kind of boring. But it turns out that even k equals two is hard. And not only k equals two is hard, but it's even hard if you kind of push this thing down further and further to be a simpler and a simpler looking system. So, so maybe you want all the, the constraints. So maybe k equals to two with, um, you know, all the constraints to look something like this, like um, ij, ij, for example. Um, and even if you wanted to be, I think you could even do this on a 2D lattice, for example, um, where all the qubits kind of sit on this like 2D structure and the edges only go according to this lattice. Like even that's going to be a QMA hard, it turns out. You could even do it in 1D, right? Even if you're only allowing um, the qubits to kind of interact with their nearest neighbor on the left and the right, if the local dimension is high enough, not qubits, but um, dimension eight, I believe, is the record, then um, this is still hard. Okay, and not only that, we can even do something even crazier than that. I can imagine that I'm on a line, a 1D line, and there's just a single term that I just repeat over and over again, right? So I just take, there's some magical term H, um, and it's the exact same term that I repeat on every single edge. Okay, now of course this is not two qubits now, this is like two D-dimensional systems for D being quite large now. But even this turns out to be, um, well, if you parameterize correctly, it will still be QMA hard. Okay, so there, it's really kind of amazing just how hard these quantum systems can be to study. Even if, even in this setting, which is called translationally, translationally invariant, meaning you know the, the chain looks the same. I just take the exact same chain. If I shift it over one to the right, it looks identical. All the terms are the same, right? There's like, there's almost no room uh, to play around here, right? And it's still hard to solve for the ground state energy. Okay, so it's kind of amazing. Classically, this is not true at all, right? Classically, in 1D, you can solve the satisfiability problem, no issue, right? You just do some sort of divide and conquer. Um, you know, I don't want to get into it here, but it can be done, okay? So there's something kind of amazing quantumly here. Okay, so how are we going to show that the local Hamiltonian problem is QMA hard? And again, we're only going to do the k equals to 5 case here because it has all the main ideas, okay? Okay, by the way, the, the proof idea is kind of similar to the matrix inversion BQP hardness result we had uh, two lectures ago, right? And that's no accident. Like uh, the BQP hardness result came after this one. Um, presumably it was inspired by this setup as well. I mean, this result is very well known, of course. 
but I don't know for sure, to be honest. Okay, so let's be a little bit formal. Proof, and of course we'll just sketch it. I mean, we don't have time to go through all the details and there are quite a few. Um, so let uh, da, 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 x be an input to uh, QMA, promise problem, a equals to a yes, a no, and then technically we always worry about this invalid setting, although uh, in, in this setting it's not a big deal. Okay, and so this is a promise problem. There's some quantum verifier and, you know, I fixed the input size for a second, you know, it's just, let's just assume it's n. Then I know that um, there's some verifier, verifier, uh, vn. Okay, and what is that? It's just some sequence of single and one and two qubit gates, right? Let's suppose there are m um, gates, okay? So this is my verifier, right? Just think of it this way, right? Uh, again, it, it gets the input x. You know, it's going to get a proof psi. And of course, it gets a whole bunch of ancilla qubits, technically, right? So I can break this down into one and two qubit gates. OK, so that's my starting point. OK. Um, let me maybe be slightly more uh, precise, right? Let me give these guys names because I am going to, I think, use these later. So I'm going to give these, there are three registers here, right? There's the input A, uh, sorry, the input X is in register A, right? The proof psi is in register B, and the ancilla is in register C. So this is the ancilla, proof, and this is the input. A lot of times, by the way, in the literature, they'll just kind of hard code the input and forget about it. So you won't see this explicitly, but you know, let me do it explicitly here. Okay. And um, the other thing I'm going to assume here is that, um, let's assume, again, without loss generality, that the completeness and soundness parameters parameters for V are, uh, you know, one minus epsilon versus epsilon. And I can imagine epsilon equals to like one over two to the n if you like. Okay, so remember that for QMA, we can always um, reduce the error so that in the S case, if you give me a good proof, I'll pr accept the probability exponentially close to one. In the no case, I'll reject everything with probability exponentially close to one. Okay, so let's just assume that. Um, I mean, but for now, if you like, you can just imagine epsilon is still abstract. You don't have to fix this value. Okay. Da, 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 da. And okay, so what's their goal, right? The goal is what? Is to map the verifier V, right? And this, so this is some sequence of gates, right? To a, a five local H such that, what? So this is what you should always keep in mind, right? So if you want to make a note of this on a separate piece of paper, so you can always look at it if you feel like you get confused, right? The name of the game is this, right? Such that um, x is an a yes, right? So we have a yes instance of our QMA problem, right? If and only if the, well, let me see how I want to state this. Um, yeah, lambda min of h, right? This is what I'm creating here, is smaller than alpha. This is uh, to be determined, right? I haven't defined alpha yet, but I'm going to define an alpha, right? So that this is true. So, okay, maybe I should be a bit more precise. Technically, what I should have said here, right? Technically. Um, and, um, okay, so I should say that I'm going to take the circuit and I'm going to map that to three parameters, right? Uh, that's not three, that's four, three. Um, H, alpha, beta. Okay, satisfying these properties. In the S case, the eigenvalue is small. And, uh, sorry. If the eigenvalue, if you're in the S case, then, oops, then your eigenvalue is small. If you're in the no case, then your eigenvalue is large. Okay? Right, so I'll, I'll figure out what those values alpha and beta are later, right? But this is the goal, right? This is what the mapping reduction will do. And of course, we want the reduction to run in polytime. 
Okay. So, you know, if you're still a bit fuzzy on the setup and kind of what our goal is, you know, I urge you to stop the video now and take a moment to really sit back, reflect, make sure you understand the setup, right? We have this input X, um, you know, there's some verifier for this QMA uh, promise problem. And we are going to now map that to Hamiltonian and parameters alpha beta so that if we had a yes case of our QMA problem, whatever QMA problem it is, I don't know anything about it other than I, I have some description of the verifier, that's it. Then the ground state energy is small of H. Otherwise, in the no case, the ground state energy will be large. Okay, and once you're comfortable with that, we can go on to the actual construction. Okay, so again, these proofs always tend to follow, well, that's paradoxical in some sense, not always tend to follow, but they tend to follow, right, the same kind of pattern, which is um, you state the construction clearly, right, then you prove correctness of the construction, and usually, usually, um, the runtime of the construction is kind of obvious, so we don't really say much about it. But if it's not obvious, then you should say something about that too. Okay, so the basic idea is similar to the Cook-Levin theorem. This is why we went through the Cook-Levin theorem, all right? So remember in the Cook-Levin theorem, what we did is we set up kind of these this tableau, right? With these time steps, and we had these configurations, right? You started at maybe time t equals zero, and you went all the way up to say time t equals m, right? And now um, what we're going to do quantumly is we're going to do the same thing. We're going to associate to each of these some quantum state, which um, will be appropriately encoded. We'll talk about that in a second, right? So that's time t equals 1 now. And all the way up to, uh, you guessed it, psi m, right? So we're going to have quantum configurations, if you will. And a key difference will be that instead of writing these things out one after the other, now we're going to put them all into superposition. Okay, so my state, um, you know, the, the proof, uh, sorry, well, it's not in quotes because this is the proof. Well, the ideal proof is going to be uh, the sum over t equals 0 up to m of all time steps of the state psi t, which I haven't defined yet. And, of course, I need to normalize this. Um, by the way, um, the normalization is correct because uh, it'll turn out that these guys are orthonormal states. Uh, that's not obvious yet, but the way we'll define it, they will be orthonormal states. And this will be something called the history state. Oops. Right, so it's called the history state. And the reason is because, well, it contains a history of the entire computation in superposition. Where have we seen this before? Well, it's very similar to what we saw for the BQP hardness uh, result, right? And the propagation Hamiltonian we'll write down shortly will look also very similar to what we saw in that uh, BQP hardness construction. Okay, so that's the very, very high level idea, right? We want to come up with a Hamiltonian so that the, um, the optimal solution, just like with these tableaus where the optimal solution was supposed to encode the idea of kind of filling out this tableau according to the rules of the, the Turing machine, Quantumly, we want to define a Hamiltonian so that the ground state, the, the satisfying assignment, if you will, is has a is a superposition of all of the you know the time steps of the the quantum verifier, appropriately encoded. We haven't talked about that yet. Um, in something called the history state, this is the goal. Okay, and um, now there is a slight problem. Right? The slight problem a priori is the, the following, right? Um, what do we want to do? We want to make sure that not three things, right? In the starting configuration, we start at the right time step. When we end, we end in an accepting time step, right, uh, configuration. And all the intermediate configurations all follow from one another, in our case, according to the rules of the verifier V, right? That's what we want to check. Now, um, here in the tableau picture, this was very easy to kind of encode in the sense that the, the row index, right, physically denoted the time, right? I mean, if I wanted to know um, if time, you know, i uh, followed from time i minus 1, I just had to look at rows, you know, i minus 1 and i, right? I, I knew exactly um, how time was encoded. Over here, it's not explicitly obvious, right? Because we're instead of putting things physically next to each other in rows, I've crammed them all into one register, right, in superposition. So I lose this very nice interpretation that uh, the row number now tells me the time. So to kind of make up for it, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, and this is the idea that did, one of the ideas that dates back to Feynman is we're going to attach a separate clock register that will keep track of the time. Okay, 
And in that sense, you know, each term in the superposition will correspond to one row of this table. And by the way, this is also in the BQP hardness construction. Okay, so the key idea here, well, I mean, there's more than one key idea, but a key idea here is the attach a clock register. And so what does that mean? That means that, well, what does my state look like? Well, I, I have, first I started with three registers, right? I'm just gonna remind you. I had input register A, proof register B, and still a register C, right? So here's proof register A, uh, sorry, um, input. Um, this is supposed to be your proof, right? And this is your ancilla. That's what we started with. And now I need to add a new register because I, otherwise I don't really have a way of keeping track of time, right? So I'm gonna have a separate time register and I'm gonna call that D from now on. So this is what we'll call the clock register. Um, Yes, I know it would have been better to name that C instead of D, but you know, D is the fourth letter of the alphabet and that's the fourth register. So um, you can go blame Katai, right? Um, so, so this is the start state. And what does it mean now to be in the teeth step of the computation the way I've done it? Well, that just means that, you know, I've applied the gates V1 up to VT, right? The first T gates in my verifier. And that is exactly how I'm going to define you know, my quantum configuration side T. So, you know, you should really think of these as uh, quantum configurations, if you like, just like with the Turing machine. Okay. Okay, so now let me be very explicit. Therefore, you know, I'm just gonna rewrite this history state. This history state is one over the square root of the number of time steps. Oh, technically there's n plus one time step, sorry. Because we started zero. We have to do that in order to encode the initial conditions to test those. So t up to m, right? And now it's just each of them, right? We start with um, x, psi, proof, basically, and scylla, clock register, um, well, clock register, sorry, is t, right? And then uh, we do v1 up to vt. Okay, that is your history state. Okay, so this is important. So this is the quantum tableau, if you will, right? We just cram the whole thing into one n qubit register rather than having um, one such register per time step. Okay, we do it in superposition. Um, just as a sanity check, notice how you know this thing starts over here at uh, v equals to one. So when the time step t equals zero, like when t is zero here, right? Then you know that means that no unitaries are applied, right? This is the initial time step. Okay. So um, just to be clear, you know, if I define psi zero, it's just equal to um, x psi um, zero and zero, technically in the clock register, right? Just to be clear. Okay, good. So just like the classical setting, we started by saying, okay, I'm gonna define, first I'm gonna have an idea of what it is that I'm aiming for, right? I'm aiming for this tableau construction. And then I wanted to define uh, a Boolean formula that would enforce this type of structure, right? Now we're playing the same game, okay? Just um, with um, quantum tools, right? Which is really just a fancy way of saying linear algebraic tools rather than Boolean formulas, right? Let's be honest. Uh, and so this is now my quantum tableau, right? This kind of state. I want to force the prover to send me something that looks like this, right? Because if I have something like this, then well, how can I check the time? I'm sorry, how can I check that you got the right answer? Well, look at this, right? It has all, if you were to send me this, it has all the time steps in superposition. And if I measure the clock register, right? Here it is. With probability, you know, one over n plus one, because that's the number of time steps here, I will collapse onto the very last time step, right? And then once I collapse onto the very last time step, you know, everything else here will be, you know, the full circuit um, right after it completed, right? Because you'll see V1 up to Vm. All of them will have been applied. And then I could just read the output qubit and tell you what the answer was, okay? So it's really nice from the history state, I can extract with um, good probability what is the probability of um, the verifier having accepted, the QMA verifier. Okay, but now I need to make sure that you as the prover send me this quantum tableau, this history state. 
So how are we going to do it? So now the goal is to design a five uh, local H. Um, and now I'm going to define it just like before. So there will be an initialization term, just like for the classical setting. There will be an out term, upper term, just like the classical setting. There will be a propagation term. The one term we won't have is we won't have that alpha term, which was to ensure that cells contain the right types of symbols. That we won't need here anymore. It's actually nicer in the quantum setting. I know it's weird saying that, but um, especially when it comes to the study of satisfiability, I find a lot of times phrasing things in the quantum setting, because it's really just the generalization to this very nice linear, uh, linear algebraic framework, um, you can kind of see things with a very unified lens, right? So even though classically, um, so for example, if you're studying um, things like say max cut classically or three sat or whatever, right? They look like rather different optimization problems, right? In the quantum setting, they're all just special cases of local Hamiltonian, right? It's just one big unified framework, right? Um, and in that sense, it becomes, sometimes it can be easier to write things down quantumly than classically, okay? And so we don't need that H alpha. Um, we will need another term, which I haven't put here yet. And we'll get to that um, when we get to it. OK, so we'll d the goal is to define a Hamiltonian H such that um, psi history is, um, well, OK, a ground state of H. And now, technically speaking, we won't be able to achieve this. OK? It'll turn out that, um, in general, it'll be impossible. Like, classically, it was fine. But quantumly, it will be impossible to satisfy, to give me a, a vector that perfectly sits in the ground space of each of these terms simultaneously. You can't satisfy all three simultaneously. Um, that's OK. The construction we come up with will be good enough. It'll turn out that psi history will be, um, will have energy at most alpha, which is all we need to worry about in the S case. It doesn't have to be an uh, the exact ground state. Okay, so let's do this now. So, um, first let's talk about Ancilla initialization. Or let's just talk about initialization in general. So what did we want to do? We wanted to make it so that um, you know, at the beginning of the computation, remember, the verifier is supposed to do what? Well, at time step t equals 0, here's time step t equals 0, this one here. Your, sorry, this is a psi, not an x. The first register A was supposed to be initialized to the input. I can't say anything about the second register B because I don't know what the proof is ahead of time. And C was supposed to be initialized to the ancilla, all zeros. And so, um, that's what I want to initialize. Just like the first row of the tableau classically should have been the input and then, um, for example, blank symbols, same idea here, okay? So how do we do that? Well, this is what we do. We basically define Hn, right? So this is the first uh, term here. We define that one so that if you deviate from having an x in your first register or all zeros in your third register, then you're going to be hit with an energy penalty. You cannot live in the ground space. And I'm just going to write down the simplest expression for this, right? If we project onto the orthogonal complement of x in the first register, right? Let's do this first. So what will this thing do? If you are the, you know, if you're, if this is not obvious to you, that's fine. You know, take a moment to pause the video and see it. Um, this thing here is a projector, right? It has eigenvalues 0 and 1. The unique null state is just going to be x, right? If you correctly initialize this register, if I if I multiply this by x and then stuff, right, then you will be in the null space of this operator, OK? Everything else, well, everything orthogonal to x, I should say, in the first register uh, will have an energy penalty of 1. And more generally, if you deviate from x at all in that first register, you will have some energy penalty, OK? Now, this is not enough because I also have this clock register, right? And in particular, this is checking the very first initial step, right, before we start computing. So I need to project onto time step 0, OK? Because that's when I'm doing the check at time step 0. OK, what does this do? This thing just checks now at time step 0 that the first register is set to um, x, 
And I also want to make sure that the ancilla is set to all zeros, so I'm going to add a second term now. The second term is also going to be at time step zero. And the main difference now is that you know I want to project out anything other than all zeros. Okay. This is um, the input Hamiltonian term. Okay, so um, let me make two comments here. Okay, so the first thing is that, you know, these are all, both of these are projectors, right? This is a projector, right? And these are uh, certainly all projectors. So a tensor product of projectors is still a projector. And so this is positive semi-definite. Uh, likewise, this is for the same reason this will be positive semi-definite. So the entire thing will be positive semi-definite. Okay? And this means that the smallest eigenvalue is zero. And you can be precisely in that null space by correctly having whenever your clock is zero by setting x uh, in the first register and zero in the third register. Then you will always annihilate this term hn. Okay? The other thing is that uh, the way I've written hn right now, hn is not local. Right, so in particular, I mean, look at this thing, right? This thing is a, a joint projector on all of x, right? On all of the n input bits, right? But that's not right, right? I needed my, um, my Hamiltonian to be five local, right? That's what I said. So, you know, I'll let you think about how you could very easily turn this into a, a sum of one local projectors, right? It's a bit easier over here to, to simulate, for example, this one here. Um, if you want to make sure you have all zeros, basically, uh, in the ancilla, you can instead do something like this, right? Um, oh, sorry. Basically, if you see a one anywhere in any of these registers in C, maybe I should call this CI, right? Then you'll penalize it, right? You could do it as a sum of one local terms if you want instead. But you know, let me not say more. Okay, so just like for the the tableau, this makes sure that. Um, when we start the computation, uh, the first register is initialized to the input. The third register is initialized to all zeros. The second term we need is the output term. Uh, OK, sorry. Maybe we should do this uh, quick exercise, by the way. Um, because um, you know, I'll do it once. We can't do it for all of them in the interest of time. But let's. This is exercise uh, 32, right? So let's convince ourselves that if you give me a proper history state, then I will indeed lie in the null space of HN. OK, so the history state was up here, right? It was this thing up here. And so now let's check, right? HN times psi history, right? What is that? So psi history, remember, is a sum over time steps, right, in the clock register. And HN only cares about one time step, right? It's just in both the D registers here, it, it just cares about the zero time step. Everything else is going to get uh, annihilated. And so what I can immediately say is that this thing will be equal to just the zeroth time step of my history state. So technically, you know, I have to keep the normalization around. That's not going to go anywhere when I project out part of this, this uh, vector. And then I will get XA psi zero T. Right, B, C, D. Uh, sorry, where'd my H and go? Right. So these will be equal. Uh, I can get rid of all the other time steps because they're going to have zero expectation against H n. And now I can just check, right? I mean, if I look at this thing, right, this term here, when I multiply uh, by uh, this first expression, right, that's going to go to zero because x uh, lies in the null space of i minus x. And likewise for this term here. Uh, this term will be in the null space of the second projector. OK, so I'll, I'll let you work out the, you know, the very fine details of that if you, if you don't feel comfortable with it. But yeah, I just wanted to show you roughly that, indeed, you know, so far, um, the history state we designed, basically, lies in the null space of this input check. OK? So it passes that input check. And now let's do the second one, which is, um, da, 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 the correct output. Correct output. Okay. 
And now the whole idea here is that, of course, that at the end of the computation, we want to make sure that the quantum verifier's output qubit uh, was a one. You're supposed to accept, right? So if you're not accepting, we want to penalize you. And again, the, the idea is very similar to the input uh, Hamiltonian, right? Now, the main difference is in the D register, in the clock register. What time step do we care about? Well, we care about the last time step, right? And so what is that? That is M, right? At time step M. Okay, and what do we want there? Now, we have to be a little bit careful. Let's just assume that um, so far in this course, we tended to assume that the output qubit of a quantum verifier is going to be the first qubit of the ancilla C. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. So it's just a single zero on C1, right? So here's my ancilla register, and it's just the first qubit of that, right? So this is the output qubit of V. Okay, so what it's saying is that uh, if, and let me be clear, I mean, again, this is implicit, I'm not going to write it down every time, but the idea is that on s the remaining qubits in the ancilla, dot, 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 right, there's just a, a big identity there, right? I'm not touching those, I'm just checking that very first qubit of the ancilla. Okay, and this is just basically saying that, you know, if at time step m, if your output qubit reads zero, that's bad, right? You're supposed to be an accepting computation, right? You're claiming to be a yes instance. Okay, so then we're going to penalize that. So this is the output check. And Again, you know, I'll let you think about why it's true that this thing is positive semi-definite. Okay, and now uh, kind of the most interesting term is the correct propagation term. How do I make sure that indeed in the history state we have um, one time step appearing after the next with the correct gate applied? Okay. Um, duh, 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 duh. Okay, so the way we're going to do it is, I guess I'll just write it out fully, which is the following. So the propagation Hamiltonian. Now this is going to have one term per time step, right? So t up to m minus one. There's only m minus one because um, you know this will always involve pairs of time steps, right? We're checking the current one compared to the next one, right? And so what's the idea? The basic idea is very similar to what we saw in the BQP hardness construction, which was you start at time step t. You go to time step t plus one, right? In this is in the clock register because that's where the times are stored. And when you do that, you want to apply um, the t plus first unitary in your circuit, right? Your quantum circuit had uh, gates v one through v m, right? You apply the t plus first one because you're moving from step t to t plus one. Technically, we're going to put a minus here, and that's just simply because. Um, if you're a valid history state, we want things to kind of cancel out, and, and that's why that minus is going to come into play, okay? Because we, we want the history state to line the null space of this propagation term. And now, you could, in theory, do this, right? But this is not a Hermitian operator, right? I mean, look, um, this, this, the clock register is not even symmetric, right? So, and we need this to be a Hamiltonian. It's got to be Hermitian. So at the very least, I have to put in the dagger of this term, and that's the next term, right? Exact same thing, I'll put a dagger now, right? And I get to flip the terms now in the clock register. Okay. So now it's Hermitian. And in principle, this should work. But as I've written it, it's not positive semi definite right now, right? I mean, if, just by staring at this, it's kind of like if you think about it in terms of the D register here, right? It's, it's off diagonal here, right? I mean, you've got stuff on T and T plus one versus T plus one and T. Right, so you can think of it as some block diagonal matrix, which is, um, which has nothing on the diagonal, basically. Um, and it's typically nicer to work in the PSD setting, and in particular, um, it'll turn out later in the analysis to be nicer if uh, we kind of add some terms to make things uh, positive semi-definite. And so all I'm going to do is just add identities in the right spots. And so here it's just going to be a time step t. So I'm adding the diagonal terms, right? So. Um, these are off-diagonal, t and t plus 1. And I mean, so we can think of it this way. When I say it's blocked off-diagonal, I mean the following, right? Um, I can imagine that I write um, this propagation Hamiltonian in terms of the D matrix, right? I could write uh, maybe this is um, block t and this is block uh, t plus 1, uh, likewise here in t plus 1. And so right now, the Hamiltonian only has 
can await here and here, right, with respect to this block decoding. And so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to add uh, here and here. I'm going to add these diagonal terms so that I can make things PST. So I'll add an identity term on TT and same thing on T plus 1, T plus 1. Okay. That's it. And again, these are on the clock register. Okay, so this is my propagation Hamiltonian. And... Um, you know, I'll say a bit more about it when we do completeness in the interest of time. But again, this is very similar to the BQP uh, hardness result. And this will ensure that when I go from time t to t plus 1, you know, I really do apply the gate vt. Okay. So question, you know, is um, h... Oh, yeah, so sorry. Before I go anywhere, let's just define h. This is kind of where we... Define h to be therefore equal to hn plus h prop plus h out. Okay. So here's the question Is h5 local? So the answer is no, not as written, right? So first, you know, these projectors are not uh, local, right? As we already discussed. Uh, but even then, another thing is not local, which is, you know, this clock register, right? This clock register T, right now, I'm just writing, you know, the index T, right? But, you know, how many bits do I need to represent T? Well, if there are M time steps, then I need log of M bits to represent the integer T, right? Um, so no, so the clock is uh, log N local, or log M local, more accurately. Okay. At the end, if you have time, we'll deal with that, right? Um, we can actually um, get rid of that non-local encoding for the clock. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, intuitively, the main ideas are here, OK? I just want to point that out to you. OK, so that's the construction. That's input, propagation, and output. And now, like I said, the next thing you always want to do is show correctness, OK? So in particular, I want to show that if you take this Hamiltonian we constructed, in the yes case, if you give me the ground state, uh, well, there'll be a state you can give me so that it will have low energy against this Hamiltonian. The expectation will be smaller than alpha. For alpha, I haven't defined yet. And in the no case, right, um, all the eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian will be large, right? Um, where was this? Da, 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 da. Where did we put that thing? Here, right? This was the key uh, thing right here, right? X is an AS implies the smallest eigenvalue will be small. X is an A no small second value is large. Okay, and intuitively in this yes case, the to prove that the eigenvalue is small, you're gonna give me the ground state, right? Uh, or the history state uh, is what we aimed for. Okay, so, so let's do correctness. Okay, so there are two uh, sides to this, right? Of course, we have to do completeness, soundness, yes case, no case, completeness. So suppose x is an AS, right? So we have a yes instance, OK? And so what do we want? We want that there exists a psi such that uh, psi h psi is at most some alpha, which we haven't defined yet, OK? And you know this analysis will make it clear what alpha needs to be. Well, only half of what we need. Okay, so the claim is that, of course, the proof is going to be the history state, right? We constructed H to simulate, to force the structure of the history state. So, so the idea is going to be choose psi equal to psi history. Okay? And so if you do that, what is this expectation? Uh, psi history state, H, psi history state. Right, what is this? Well, you know, h is just the sum of terms, so I could do this, right? Psi hist um, hn plus same thing now on the propagation term. And finally, same thing now on the output term. Okay. Okay, so it's just by linearity you get this. 
And so now the thing is that, you know, we've already shown that if you give me a properly initialized history state, right, it will be um, in the null space of HN, right? Because the input, um, the, at time step zero, everything is initialized correctly, right? So we know that this is zero, right? Formally speaking, this is one of the exercises, um, exercise 32, I think, right? Exercise 32. And likewise for the propagation Hamiltonian, um, did we do that as an exercise? Okay, let's do that exercise now. But um, okay, exercise 36 basically means that, um, sorry, this is gonna be zero. Let me quickly do that, because I think that's important to see. And so we'll be left with um, so take me on faith, take it on faith right now that this is really zero, and we'll do that in a second. And so all we'll get left is the psi history h out psi history, right? Assuming you believe it. Okay. And now um, what I want you to do, right, is um, exercise thirty-eight. Show that psi history h out psi history is equal to uh, 1 over m plus 1 times the probability that v accepts, um, oh, this is a typo, yeah, v accepts psi. Okay, and what is that? Um, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. It, it is a reject, sorry. We're in the S case. Uh, you have to think backwards, right? Because we're trying to minimize the ground state energy. What is the probability that V rejects psi history in this case? Right? And we know that in the S case, remember, this was going to happen with probably at most epsilon. So, you know, the, the key thing you need to show is this. And then this part now you just get for free, right? It's just epsilon over m plus 1. Okay? And so, you know, this is going to be our alpha, right? Because um, let's define alpha to be epsilon over m plus 1. I know m ahead of time is the size of the circuit. I know epsilon, that's the soundness parameter, basically, or the completeness parameter. Um, and so I can set alpha this way, OK? OK, uh, the only thing I just want to convince you of now is uh, this claim over here, that indeed the history state will lie in the null space of this propagation Hamiltonian. And let's just very briefly check this, right? Um, OK, so let's just do this exercise 36, at least sketch the idea quickly, right? And so remember the propagation Hamiltonian was a sum of terms over t. So I'll just show you what happens for one term t, right? And so in particular, what do we have? Um, let's do exercise 36. If I look at h prop, um, and I'll just look at one term t, right? So I'll just say comma t. So this is the teeth term is what I mean. And then psi history, right? What is this equal to? Well, the teeth term of h prop is minus vt tensor t plus 1 t minus vt dagger. Um, so now we go backwards t um, from t plus 1. And then remember we had these two funny identity terms on t and on t plus 1. OK, so this is just one term of h prop. Um, the others are analogous, OK? OK, and this thing times psi history. Um, da, 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 right. OK, so what happens here is that, you know, now I'm going to have these inner products, right? I have, for example, like this t plus 1 on psi history state, right? So it's going to project the psi history state as a superposition over all the time steps. When I hit it with, say, t plus 1 on the clock register, it's going to collapse that thing down onto just time step t plus 1. So when we expand this out, what are we going to get, right? Well, we're going to get minus vt, right? First, I'm dealing with this term. And now it's going to project the clock register onto, well, it's going to hit it with a t, right, on the right. And then it's going to replace that with a t plus 1 on the left. So when I expand this out, what I will get is t plus 1 in the clock register, like when I hit this with the history state. And the state I collapsed onto was this one, right? It was this the teeth time step. So what I knew at that point was that I had, you know, um, ancilla proof input, right? At this point, though, I was at time step t, right, before I moved to t plus 1. So the history state at this point had applied v1 all up to 
the T. Wait, did I do this right? Da, 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 da. Sorry, this should be T plus one. Good. Now it makes sense. Okay, so that should be T plus one. Okay, and so you'll notice what just happened, right? This is the part I kind of extracted out of the history state. And now by multiplying by this thing, it updated the counter from t to t plus 1, and it hit me with the next um, unitary in the sequence, vt plus 1. So this is what happens when I do the first, that comes from this first term when you hit it with the history state. Now, let's do the second term, that's this one here. Right, what happens here? Well, now I project onto time step t plus 1. It gets replaced with time step d, t, right? Again, uh, these registers don't change. Okay, and I projected onto time step t plus one in the history state. So what had the history state done up to that point? Well, it had done v one up to v t plus one. Okay, that's what it had done. So that's all of this, right? That's what the history state had done. But now, of course, I'm adding this additional uh, v t plus one dagger over here, right? And so this one goes v t plus one dagger. Right? So this is what I get now. And you know, if you just stare at this, this one's kind of, uh, you'll see these last two terms will of course cancel now. Um, there you go, okay. Good, and now, but I now I still have the identity terms, right? Um, if I want to talk about null space, this is why we added the identity terms. So now let's do the same thing. Uh, now I have this term, right? So that just projects onto time step t and does nothing. Right, so in the history state, the teeth time step just looks like this. Zero, psi, x, and it just goes v1 up to vt. That's just literally the teeth time step in the history state. And last but not least, let's do this one over here. The very Again, we're just projecting onto time t plus 1 now. Zero, psi, x, v1, up to time vt plus 1 now. Okay, that's what this is. And now I've multiplied out all four terms, I just add, right? So who's going to cancel with who? Well, as you can see, you know, here I have um, the circuit up to vt plus 1 with a minus. Here I have the circuit up to vt plus 1 with a plus. So these two will cancel, right? And likewise, these two cross terms will cancel as well, right? Because uh, vt plus 1 dagger will cancel with the vt plus 1. So you'll get v1 up to vt on both ends, okay, with a minus sign here. So this is equal to zero, okay? Zero, not zero factorial, it's zero, okay? Okay, so if um, you didn't fully follow the steps of that, that's completely fine, of course, just pause the video and make sure you do the calculation by hand to see um, why that holds. Okay, so now we need to talk about soundness. That will take up the rest of the lecture, basically. And again, I won't be able to get into all the details, but I'll give you the main ideas, right? So that was completeness that um, in the yes case, the history state really will have a small energy, meaning at most, um, what was it? It was epsilon over m plus one, I think. Yeah, epsilon over m plus one, okay? And that was because the history state is really in the null space of the in term, the propagation term, and it only has some output uh, penalty on the h out term, that's it. Okay, but now, If x is an a null, right, I can't assume anything about the proof I'm given. It, it may be a history state, it may not uh, be a history state, right? Um, and so I have to argue now that no matter what, you're going to have high energy against h, okay? So remember, we want uh, for all psi that psi h psi is at least beta, and you know, I haven't defined beta yet. Now, the, the key problem here, right, is, you know, now I need to prove a spectral property about H. I want to prove that its smallest eigenvalues at least say beta, right? How do I do that, right? H is what? It's equal to Hn plus H out plus H prop, okay? The problem here is that all the terms here do not pairwise commute, okay? So Hn and H out, they do commute. The order of multiplication doesn't matter. But 
h prop does not commute with these two guys, right? So when I start multiplying h prop, for example, by h out, you know, the order starts to matter. Okay, and the reason why this matters is because if they all um, recall that um, if uh, a and b, if you had two operators which commute, and they're normal, let's, these are normal operators, then they simultaneously diagonalize. Okay, so that meant that there was some common eigenbasis in which everything looks diagonal. And so when that happens, it's great because you can just add up the eigenvalues, right? I mean, um, they all have, you know, there's some eigenvector that will kind of pick an eigenvalue from each um, operator and just kind of add them up, right? But if the operators don't pairwise diagonalize, um, commute, then they don't share a common basis in which they um, diagonalize. So I cannot just say, oh, the eigenvalues of H are going to be, uh, I don't know, the smallest eigenvalue of H in plus the smallest eigenvalue of H out. It doesn't work that way, right? And that's the challenge. So the main lemma one has to prove here, which I'll leave um, to the last bit of the lecture, is the following. First, let's just see what happens when we have this lemma. If x is an a no, then you can prove that lambda min of h in plus h out plus h prop is at least um, pi squared 1 minus the square root of epsilon, epsilon being that uh, completeness parameter. 2 times m plus 1 cubed. Okay, and this is what we're going to call beta. Okay, because in the no case, uh, well, it looks like a happy face almost, um, this is what we'll call beta. Okay, okay, um, okay so those are going to be our thresholds, right? So in the no case, well, we're going to prove that the small stacking value of this thing is large, and by large, I mean this, right? And now, I, you know, I do want to be slightly careful. I mean, that more or less would complete the proof. Well, modulo two things. Number one is that let's look at alpha versus beta, right? Um, alpha was something like, um, well, it wasn't something like, it was exactly, sorry, epsilon, whoops, epsilon over m plus one. So this is what we had defined, right? So in the yes case, we want it to be at, at most alpha, right? And in the no case, we want it to be, you know, at least this beta term here, right? which looks like this. And now stare at those for a second and realize that alpha is not smaller than beta, right, in general, right? I mean, in the sense that, you know, if we fix epsilon to be constant, like in the standard definition of QMA, epsilon is just a third, then basically you have one over m for alpha, one over m cubed for beta. So beta is much smaller than alpha in general. And so, in order for this to work, right, in order for to alpha to really be smaller than beta, what you need to do is you need to use error reduction on the QMA verifier, right? So you need to make epsilon not a third, but it should be at least like a sufficiently small inverse polynomial, okay? And then you this thing will be one over poly, and this thing will scale like one minus one over poly, so approximately one over m cubed, okay? So then you can uh, separate these two. Sorry. Um, Okay, um, good. So in particular, when epsilon is exponentially small, this thing goes you know, to, to zero exponentially quickly. Uh, this thing will approach one over m cubed, okay? All right, so that's one thing. The other thing is locality, right? Um, the clock is not local. How do we make the clock local? So perhaps in the interest of time, I will not uh, do that now because I'd rather say a little bit more about the soundness. But in the course notes, there's a section on locality, right? You can take the clock, um, and instead of checking all login bits to read the time off of it, right, where you encode the time in binary, instead you can encode the time in unary, right? You just, a sequence, if the time step is t, then you just put a sequence of t1s. And then you always know um, what time it is just by figuring out where is the, that transition from ones to zeros, right? That, that position will tell you exactly what the time is. The disadvantage of this, is that we have to add another Hamiltonian term that makes sure that the clock is encoded correctly, like as in unary, basically. I don't want to get into that now. It's in the course notes, okay? So you're welcome to have a look there. What I want to do is uh, just sketch kind of the last section, right, which is 
3.2.1, proof of soundness. And how do we prove this, this lemma 40, right? How do I prove that the smallest eigenvalue of a sum of um, operators which don't all commute is lower bounded by something? I use something called the geometric lemma. Okay? And that's just a very nice um, linear algebraic lemma that's worth knowing in and of its own, even in and of itself. Okay, so now we can go to the last phase of today's discussion, which is trying to sketch the main ideas behind how do you prove um, lemma 40 in the nodes, which is in the no case, this Hamiltonian that we constructed has a non-trivial smallest eigenvalue, okay? And uh, the key tool is this geometric lemma. And so what's the basic idea here, right? So, so remember we want to bound, lower bound more accurately, lambda min of h in plus h out plus h prop. Okay, so this is what we want, right? Okay, so the starting point for this analysis is that it actually turns out to be easier to first change basis. Okay, so right now in particular, this propagation Hamiltonian, right, it looks like this funny, weird, uh, nasty mess. Where did my uh, cursor go? There it is, right? Remember, it has terms that look like this, and, you know, it's, it's kind of nasty, right? So the first thing we'll do is we will take our Hamiltonian H and we'll conjugate it by a push, uh, an appropriate choice of unitary so that um, the resulting operator we get is much nicer, right? And remember, this is totally allowed because conjugation under unitary does not change eigenvalues, right? Remember, if I take my operator and I do U, um, well, let me just write it down rather than air drawing it, air teaching, let's say, right? Um, so recall that um, for all unitary U, right? U, H, U dagger um, has the same eigenvalues of h, okay? Or as h, I should say. Same eigenvalues, right? It just changed the eigenbasis, right? So if you don't see that, that's fine. Take a moment to convince yourself of that fact. And so the first thing we will do is um, rotate, uh, not rat, <laughs> we will uh, change basis, let's say, via an appropriate u. Okay, so which u am I gonna choose? Well, um, let me just write it down, right? u will be the following. Sum over all time steps, t equals zero, up to m. And it will project onto time step t in the time register. And what it's gonna do is Essentially, what I want to do is the following, right? I want to look at this. Here's, you know, here's one term in the propagation Hamiltonian, right? And, you know, it has all this um, nasty business, like there's forwards v, backwards v, at time step t plus one, and so forth. I essentially want to flush all that computation out. It's kind of like, um, you know, you want to ferret kind of like uh, rabbits out of their rabbit holes, right? That, that's the way I always like to... Um, visualize this trick, right? You're gonna, so we're gonna flush out the computation. How do we do that, right? Um, the way we do this is at time step t, I want to undo all the unitaries v, essentially, right? I wanna do v1 dagger all the way up to vt dagger. Okay, so this is my claimed unitary. So exercise 44, which I want to hear, prove that U indeed is unitary, right? It's not obvious at all, right? Prove that it's unitary. Okay, so just compute U times U dagger. This is a good exercise. And the other exercise whose details I will also skip, but the, the conclusion of which is important, is the following, is that U H prop U dagger is what? So I'm gonna write out the propagation Hamiltonian now under this change of basis. And what's different, I'll write with red. Okay, otherwise it looks identical. But the key point again is that we flushed out the, the computation terms vi or vt. So this goes from t to t plus one now. 
plus um, identity tensor. Uh, so this part's the same, right? T T plus identity uh, tensor T plus one, T plus one. Okay, so this part's the same. Um, what happened is that these VT terms um, disappeared here. Okay, the VT plus one technically. Okay, so in particular, what this means is that um, you know I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this, but it will be important, right? Um, again, this is in the lecture notes. Is that um, we can write u h prop u dagger. I mean, you'll notice that what is this really like? I mean, you're just doing some sort of counting stuff in the d register, right? And everything else is just an identity, right? On all on A B C, we just have identity. And so I can always rewrite this thing as um, identity on the first three registers, ABC, because you know here here's ABC, right? It's not doing anything on these registers, right? So let me factor that out. And here I'm going to have a register which in the notes I call lambda, uh, a matrix that's on D. And what is what is this thing? Right? It's very simple actually to write down, right? It's some tridiagonal matrix. So it's one minus one, minus one, one. Basically, this is the basic matrix, and now it's going to repeat itself. But now it's going to overlap, right? So I'm going to um, put uh, another copy of this here. So you're going to get minus one, minus one, one. But now I have two times one here. So really, that's going to end up being two. Let me erase that. I do. Ah, there it goes. All right, so now that's a two. And, and so forth, right? So we'll end up having twos on the diagonals, minus ones on the off diagonals, and so forth, right? Okay, and everything else is just going to be a zero in the off diagonal terms. Okay, and this is a very nice um, matrix. This can be seen as uh, a 1D random walk matrix. The exact uh, you know details we won't have time to get into, but the basic idea is that you can, you can vision that you can view this as a walk on a line where we're probably a half in one step we stay put um, and we're probably uh, I guess a quarter you go to the right and probably a quarter you go to the left okay that's what this looks like um, and what that means is that people have studied this before right and you can write down the, the eigenvalues of this matrix exactly right I won't show you how you get this right but of course we're interested in eigenvalues here and um, and what this means is that we can write uh, the kth eigenvalue of this operator, lambda, is none other than 2 times 1 minus the cosine of pi k over um, m plus 1. Okay? So now that I did this change of basis, right? The propagation Hamiltonian looks very nice. I know exactly what the eigenvalues look like. And in fact, I can also uh, prove x size 49 that um, the unique eigenvector of this thing, lambda, um, pretty sure it's a lambda. Uh, is this state gamma. It's just an equal superposition over all time steps. And we'll use this in a second. Okay. okay. So in other words, you know, this propagation Hamiltonian, which you used to look very nasty, once we do this uh, change of basis, we look at it a different way, right? We don't change the eigenvalues, right? Number one. And now this guy is just like a, a random walk matrix, and you know we can look up the eigenvalues for that basically if you if you don't want to work them out from scratch. Okay, and we also um, it's not difficult to show that well I mean you see it here right first the eigenvalues are here and you'll see that um, the eigenvalues are going to be all distinct right as as uh, k increases or changes you know um, this function you know appropriately restricted is monotonically increasing or decreasing right um, that's the cosine function right. And so, and so there's going to be a unique um, ground state, or in particular, null state for this um, eigenvector, and that's going to be uh, this one. It's a unique super, uh, equal superposition over all the time steps. Okay. Okay.
Now, the other thing I need uh, just to mention is, you know, if I do this change of basis U, right, I can't just do it to each prop. I have to do it to my whole system, right? I have to rotate H in, H out, history state. Um, all of these have to be uh, rewritten with respect to this new basis so that, you know, we're using the same kind of coordinate frame for each one, or reference frame. So that's um, another set of exercises, which I'm going to leave uh, to you to verify. Exercise uh, 50, 51, 52. And the basic idea is what happens to each of these other operators, right, when we also rotate them by this change of basis. And finally, what happens with my history state? OK, in this new reference frame. So the input guy is. Um, the easiest to deal with, it turns out that this stays completely unchanged. And intuitively, that's just because, remember, what you did is it kind of undid all the computation. But HN only cares about time step 0 when no computation was done yet, right? So there's nothing to undo. So HN should look the same. H out is uh, slightly more complicated. It's the old H out, basically. But now we have to conjugate it by the full um, verification circuit on the right, uh, on ABC, right? We don't touch the clock register. And here I have to have that same thing, but dagger on the left. OK, so um, this is the full uh, QMA verification. OK, all M gates. And finally, the history state, instead of being a big superposition over time steps, and you know, at time step t, you know, we did uh, all the gates. Now, again, we flushed out the computation. So we just have a superposition over time steps, basically. right? It's, it's literally just going to be this gamma term. Uh, where the competition no longer is in the expression, right? So in particular, what we will get is x on A, whatever proof we had on B, all zeros on the ancilla. And here I'm going to have gamma, right? Where gamma is just this thing, right? It's just a sum over all the time steps. That's it. OK. So that's the, the step one, right? We first do this change of basis because now everything uh, looks a lot nicer. And in particular, our history state looks nicer, right? Uh, we just have a sum over time steps here. And the propagation Hamiltonian is just this 1D random walk matrix. All right, so now we can talk about the geometric lemma. So let me give you the basic intuition for this lemma, and then um, we'll see how much we get through beyond that, OK? And of course, we'll state the lemma, but beyond that, we'll see. Uh, we certainly won't prove the, the lemma, um, nor you do the full analysis in depth, right? OK, so what's the basic idea, all right? Um, I wanted to talk about, um, oh yeah, so henceforth, by the way, uh, let me be clear. Let's define all of these things. I'll put a prime here from now on to denote that we're talking in this rotated basis, OK? Uh, I think I should probably have a sized prime as well, right? OK, so just to be clear. And where did my, same thing for the propagation Hamiltonian. This thing is just lagging a bit. OK, so this is what I'll call h prop prime from now on. So this just uh, under the change of basis. OK. OK. So what's the name of the game, right? I want to now lower bound the smallest eigenvalue of h in prime plus h out prime. So these two guys, you know, I'll let you confirm that on your own. They both commute with each other, right? I mean, intuitively, it's because one acts on time step 0, the other one acts on time step t. They have nothing to do with each other, right? But then I also have this annoying propagation Hamiltonian that acts on all the time steps. So it's going to just interfere with everybody, right? So how do I figure out this lower bound on um, this Hamiltonian, right? So here's the name of the game. Right, the name of the game is that. Um, let me think of this. How do I want to state my actual geometric lemma? Good. So let me think of this as an operator A1. Just call this A1 for now. And let's just think about this as A2. Okay. Both these operators are positive semi-definite, which you can verify in this example. Okay. 
And in particular, they both have a non-empty null space, right? So the propagation of Hamiltonian, remember, the, the null space of this thing was essentially this gamma state, right? And then you could put whatever you want on the registers ABC. This, this gamma is on register D, it's only on the clock. Okay, so this certainly has a null space, right? And these ones themselves also have null spaces, right? Whatever is correctly initialized or the output fully accepts, those are in the null space, right? So in other words, um, there exists, uh, you know, psi one such that um, psi one h n prime, uh, maybe I should say uh, a one because that's what I called it, right? Equals zero, right? And I also know that there's something um, that sends a two to zero, right? Right, that's this one, and that's this one, right? So individually, I can make them both go to zero, which is the smallest value that I could hope to get. The problem is that there is no, there does not exist in general, uh, a psi three such that uh, da, 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 sorry, there's no way to make everybody go to zero simultaneously. I mean, I'll just write it this way. Okay, so even though individually, if I optimize A1 locally or A2 locally, I can make them go to zero, there's no way to jointly make them go to zero. That's the problem, okay? And so, um, right, so that means, what does that mean? That means that kind of the null vectors for A2, for this propagation Hamiltonian, these guys are, you know, different than the null vectors for, for A1, for these H in plus H out, right? Um, otherwise, I'd be able to satisfy all three at the same time, right? So, you know, for example, exercise um, 54, which is, you know, important when you, if you actually sit down and do the full analysis, says that if you want to talk about the null space of H prop prime, right, what is it really? It's everything that the gamma in that last register. And then, you know, you can put, um, you know, I'm cheating a little bit, but basically you can put whatever you like on ABC. Okay, this is abusing notation a bit. And in contrast, right, and so gamma has an equal weight on all the time steps, right? In contrast, the null space of uh, hn prime plus h out prime, what does that look like? So how can you be orthogonal to those guys? Well, it turns out you could break this into the, the direct sum of three orthogonal subspaces, okay? So um, it's really, I'll write it this way, n1 plus n2 plus n3, so there are three spaces here. And this is the direct sum. So if you're not comfortable with this, I suggest you pause this video and have a quick look uh, online, how this is defined, okay? But the basic idea is that uh, you have orthogonal spaces and then you can kind of take vectors from here and take vectors from here, okay? And um, they could be smaller dimensional vectors and you can add them to get these larger vectors basically in some sense. Okay. And the whole idea is that what kind of uh, vectors are in the null space? Well, there are three types. Right. Either you satisfy um, you're in time step zero and you satisfy agent. So these are the ones that have a zero on time step zero. They have correctly initialized ancilla. You can put whatever you want on B. I don't care about the proof. And you have the correct input on A. Right. These ones are going to annihilate uh, agent. And because they have time step zero, they're going to also annihilate H out because H out only projects onto time step M, the very last one. So conversely, you could put a time step uh, M here, the very last time step. And now you need to satisfy H out prime because that's the one that checks time step M. And we had this definition for this, you know, I'll formally write it here, but uh, the point is these are all like the states where their output qubit is set correctly. Okay, and this is on ABC. Okay. And what is it, how else can you be orthogonal to H in and H out? Well, those only care about time step zero and time step M, right? So if your clock only has weight on times one to M minus one, right? Then of course you're gonna be orthogonal to them because you're just living in a totally different world, right? So the other option is you just, in the span of one, actually I don't need this thing, 
up to oops, m minus 1. Right, so your clock only has these guys, and then here you have an identity on A, B, C. That's the other option, right? And now, um, if you look at uh, these guys, right, you'll see that this null space here, right, for the propagation Hamiltonian, it has equal weight on all the time steps. And that means that kind of no matter where you pull your null vector from here, right, n1, n2, n3, this guy always has non-zero overlap with it, okay? So this means that uh, the null vectors of um, in our setting a2 and a1, right, uh, they're, they always have some non-zero overlap with one another. That's the problem. You can't satisfy, make both of these operators go to zero at the same time. So the geometric lemma tries to bound, therefore, the smallest eigenvalue of a1 plus a2 by understanding, well, how close are the null spaces of a1 and a2, right? If these two guys had very close null spaces, meaning, you know, they had a vector which uh, really, you know, is in one of the null spaces or is very close to both null spaces, let's say, then intuitively you should be able to kind of simultaneously bring both these operators down to zero. But if the null spaces of a1 and a2 are far for some well -defined, in some well-defined sense, then kind of no matter what vector you choose, it's going to be this uh, balancing act, right, where maybe you'll make a1 happy, but then a2 will be very sad, right? You can't bring them both down to zero. Okay, and that's precisely what the geometric lemma says. Geometric lemma. Okay, and I'll just state the lemma. We won't prove it. And the reason why I talked about A1 and A2 is because, you know, we can state this lemma generally. Even if you don't uh, do quantum computing in the future, you're always um, welcome to think back to this lemma if you're ever in a setting where you have got... Um, operators and you need to talk about lower bounds, right, uh, in terms of eigenvalues. This applies. There's nothing to do with quantum computing a priori. Okay, so what do I have? I have two parameters. V is a lower bound on um, the minimum, and let me be clear, this is on the non-zero eigenvalues. of uh, a1 and a2. Okay, so I mean, here's a1, here's a2, right? And they both, maybe this is zero, right? Um, this is also zero, like, um, where did my a2 go? Okay, maybe it'll come back. Uh, so if, if I think about the spectrum of a1 and a2, right, oh, there it is. Then, you know, uh, the next eigenvalue up for a1, like the gap, you know, there's, there's some gap here, right? Where the eigenvalues start again. And maybe this one uh, has a smaller gap until the eigenvalue is the next non-zero eigenvalue, right? So V is supposed to be uh, a lower bound on both these quantities, right? So in this case, um, you know, the smallest you could set V to is this quantity here because that's the smaller gap, okay? And there are no eigenvalues in inside that gap, of course, okay? So that's one thing that should come uh, into mind, right, in terms of the lowest uh, eigenvalue because, you know, if you're not able to satisfy both null spaces at the same time, then of course, somehow you are worried about, well, what's the next step up? If I'm not in the null space, what's the next eigenvalue up? If the, that jump to the next eigenvalue is huge, then you might expect that uh, the joint energy penalty on both A1 and A2 um, is you know, going to be large whether you like it or not, okay? Because you're not able to be in both the null space at the same time. So that's why V comes into play. And um, the other thing, of course, we need is some notion of how close are the two null spaces, okay? And that's basically in the main statement. Let me just write it. So the smallest eigenvalue of a1 and a2, what is that? That's going to be at least, so two times, here's this, up, this bound v that we talked about, sine squared. Don't worry, that's just a, a formality that comes out. Um, and then the key thing here is that we have the angle, and I'll define that in a second, the null space of A1. So this is going to be our notion of how close are the two null spaces. Okay, and then just over 2, the angle over 2. Okay, and so, uh, sorry, I should make put this in red, this angle, for the angle, uh, da, da, da. so if I have two, uh, spaces x and y, the angle between those two spaces is formally defined as, I mean, um, it's an arc cosine, duh, 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 
the key thing though is this thing here, right? It's the maximum over all um, unit vectors x in the first space, y in the second space, x, y, inner product, okay? So it's kind of a nasty looking expression, but don't freak out. Basically, the angle between two subspaces is just quantifying what's the best overlap I can get uh, between a vector in the first space and the second space, okay? So if the spaces are very close, maybe you can get two, a vector from x and a vector from y, that they're really, really close, they're almost the same thing. Whereas if they're kind of very far apart, then you know maybe the vectors in x and y are just in general almost orthogonal, right? So then they're, they have a very large angle. That's all this is really saying, okay? And so the smallest eigenvalue depends on these two quantities, right? Intuitively, this makes a lot of sense, right? If, the, if you have two null spaces which have a very large angle between them, then really the states you get in these null spaces are very different. And when you deviate from one of their null spaces, well, kind of the penalty you get hit by is kind of this minimum gap up to the next eigenvalue, the first excited state. So that is um, the geometric lemma. Okay, and I encourage you to kind of like uh, pause this uh, video and just work through some of these exercises kind of surrounding this uh, lemma in the notes at, the, at this point in time. Okay, and so basically what do we want to do? Remember our goal was to show that um, we wanted a lower bound on lambda min of a1 and a2 where a1 was h in plus h out prime and a2 was just h prop prime. Okay, so, so obviously I'm gonna just kind of try and apply this lemma as a black box, right? But to apply the lemma, I need two things, right? I need to um, have a lower bound on the eigenvalues um, v or nu um, inside, I think it's nu, but anyway, let's just call it v, um, of the two non-zero eigenvalues of a1 and a2. And I also need um, an estimate of this angle between the two null spaces of a1 and a2. Okay, so what I will do is um, I will just write down kind of these facts. We won't really go through them in depth. This is in the in the notes, right? Exercise 59 basically says that um, lambda min of, uh, sorry, it's not lambda min. Sorry, this is important that it's not lambda min. Okay, the smallest non-zero eigenvalue of A1, remember, which is H in prime plus H2, uh, H out prime is one. Okay, so why is this true? Prove it, right? Well, the intuition is this, right? Each of these are a projector. So these are, first they're projectors, so that means that individually their eigenvalues are zero and one, okay? But not only that, but they're also commuting projectors, which means the order of multiplication doesn't matter, right? Uh, because HN only cares about, projects onto time step zero, and H out only projects onto time step M, right? So um, they're living in orthogonal spaces. They certainly commute, right? And so this means that they simultaneously diagonalize, right? They, they share a common eigenbasis, right? We say, stated this fact again earlier in this lecture. And so what that means is that um, to get the eigenvalues of, you know, the sum of these two guys, I can just individually add eigenvalues up of the individual operators, right? Now, of course, it'll depend on how the eigenvectors line up. But the point here is that um, the eigenvalues of both operators individually are zero, and then, you know, the next, um, well, zero and one. Well, are they zero and one? No, they won't be zero and one. They'll be integers because, technically speaking, we had to rewrite HN as a sum of projectors, more accurately. But they're still commuting, and so each of them will have um, uh, natural numbers as eigenvalues. Okay. So if I add two non-zero natural numbers, if I pick a natural number from the left and a natural number from the right, the smallest non-zero value I can get, of course, is one. It's the next integer up, okay? Therefore, um, get uh, a lower bound of one, okay? So that's intuitively why that one holds. And exercise 60, uh, okay, well, this one's kind of easy because um, we already have a formula for the eigenvalues essentially of H prop, right? Remember it was this random walk matrix, right? And there's this cosine formula. Um, but the point here is that the smallest non-zero eval, 
of a2, which is equal to h prop prime, is um, 2 times, so this is just that formula we had earlier, but of course we don't like cosines, right? Well, we do, but just not in this lecture. And so the point is here, I want to convert this to something that's just like a 1 over polynomial. It's like something without a cosine, right? And so the point of this exercise is to get you to prove this lower bound, really. Okay? And the hint, as always, is Taylor series. Okay, if you're confused when you want to prove an anal analytical bound on something, Taylor series. First thing you should think of. Okay? Good. So that means that, remember, I needed two quantities to apply this geometric lemma. I needed uh, this lower bound uh, V on the f smallest non-zero eigenvalues of a1 and a2, and now I have it, right? It's going to be the minimum of 1, right? And this thing over here, which is generally smaller than 1. Okay, so therefore we'll set v equal to pi squared over m plus 1 squared, for example, right? So it's 1 over m squared, essentially. Okay. Now, the other thing um, we will do, and we're in the interest of time, you know, to keep this lecture at a reasonable length, is lemma 61, which we won't prove here, but it's in the course notes, which is that um, we need a lower bound on that angle, right, between the null spaces. So null space of um, a1, uh, my terminology is slightly different in the notes, the null space of, whoops, sorry, this is the null space of, no, don't do that, uh -huh. and the null space of a2, right, over 2, right, what is this thing? This thing is lower bounded by 1 minus the square root of epsilon all over 4 times m plus 1. Okay? And once you have this, now we have v, right? We have a lower bound on this, the sine of the angle, basically, sine squared of the angle, more accurately. Then you can just kind of plug it into this geometric lemma, right? And then get your lower bound on a1 plus a2, which we wanted, right? I mean, this is just, I have v now, right? I have this lower bound on sine squared, so I can just plug those two quantities in, and I'll get exactly what I want in terms of lambda min. Okay, uh, let me see if I want to say anything. So, I mean, basically speaking, you know, let me just write down the main equation kind of in this analysis, but I won't do it here, um, which is the following, right? Um, basically, we're interested in this quantity, right? We're interested in the maximum over all, you know, x being in the null space of the f our first base of a1, which is um, h, um, h in prime plus h out prime, okay? Uh, so this is in the x in the null space of, sorry. That should erase in a second. There it goes. Okay, so the null space of, um, oh, not a1, a2, sorry. Okay, null space of a1, right? Uh, y is in the null space of a2, okay? And these are unit vectors, okay? And remember, this is essentially the angle, right? I mean, yes, I want the sine squared of the angle, but ultimately I care about the angle, right? Then you can kind of push it through the sine uh, in the end, right? So this is really what I'm interested in, right? And let me uh, square it to make life a bit easier. Then um, I can always just rewrite this this way, right? I could always write it as, you know, the max, uh, same x and y. No, let me not rewrite the full thing. Of uh, y, x, x, y. Right? I mean, since I squared uh, over here, right, I can just kind of uh, undo the square and the absolute value, and I could rewrite it as, you know, this inner product times this complex conjugate. And now uh, the key insight is that I can instead think of this as the max over all uh, basically y now, again in the null space of the propagation Hamiltonian, um, a2. But I can get rid of the x part now, and I can just more generally think about the projector onto the null space of um, a1. 
okay? And so I can just think about it this way. And the null space of A1, right, this we understand very well, right? I want to know what is the overlap. And, you know, intuitively to analyze this thing here, right, all you have to do is go back. I mean, we've sort of already laid the groundwork for this, in fact. Um, remember at some point we had the direct sum? Where did that go? There, right? The This is my A1 operator. This is my A2 operator, right? I want to know what is the angle between these two guys. And all this is saying is that um, give me the largest overlap between somebody in this space and somebody in you know these three spaces, right? This space is easy. There's only one type of vector. It always ends in a gamma, right? So you end in a gamma, and then you have to argue that you know what is the largest overlap you can get uh, with somebody here, right? That's the analysis you need to do. And then you push it through a sine, sine squared, and you'll get essentially um, the lower bound you want. For, for this lemma 61. Okay, that's that's the basic idea. Okay. So that basically is all we need, right? So just to recap then, let's put everything together. Right? Um, through this lemma 61, when you're really carefully kind of analyzing the null space of these operators, um, H in plus H out versus uh, H prop, right? Um, you get this lower bound on the angle, you get the lower bound, um, you separately do a lower bound on the smallest non-zero eigenvalue of A1 and A2. You put them together in the geometric lemma to argue that in the no case, um, you really have no choice uh, but to have a large lower bound on your smallest eigenvalue, lambda min. Okay? So that completes the soundness analysis, right? Module the details, of course, we've left out. Remember, the way we did the soundness analysis was um, we wanted to argue that the smallest eigenvalue is large in the no case. We started with this change of basis first to, to make everything look nicer. And in particular, the propagation Hamiltonian, uh, we flushed out the computation itself and made it look like a tri tridiagonal random walk matrix. And the eigenvalues of that are very nice. Okay, They have an analytic formula. I mean, of course, the, the eigenvalues of the original propagation Hamiltonian are the exact same. It's just it's not obvious that's a, that's what the eigenvalue should be, right? And um, right, and then we applied the geometric lemma, right, to get that lower bound on the smallest eigenvalue. Okay, and remember that um, this was this lemma 40 that we just proved, right? If x is an a null, then if you combine uh, this, is what would come out of the geometric lemma basically if you go through it. And so we define this as the beta, the, the no threshold in the completeness case for the local Hamiltonian problem. Okay, so, so just to recap, um, for the QMA hardness proof, basically, right, we designed the history state as the ideal solution, right? That was kind of our quantum tableau. We wanted to then design a Hamiltonian that would force a prover to send a history state to us, right? In or if they wanted to be low energy against our Hamiltonian. And so we did that by mimicking the classical um, Cook-Levin construction. We had Hamiltonian terms for checking the initial initialization at time zero. The end, we should make sure we accept at the end of the computation, time step m. And in the middle, the propagation Hamiltonian made sure that each time step t plus one followed from the previous time step t by applying the next unitary verification um, unitary v t plus one. And to show correctness of this in the completeness case, remember, if you want to prove to me that an operator is small energy, this is easy. You just give me the eigenvector. And remember, we just uh, verified the energy by picking one of the local terms at random and measuring it and repeating this many times and applying a hoofding bound. And in the no case, we had to prove that no matter what uh, proof you give me, history state or not, you're always going to be hit with a large energy penalty. And for that, we use the geometric lemma. Okay, so this completes the proof of um, the quantum Cook-Levin theorem, which we may also call the feynman kitayev theorem, if you like. Uh, I don't know why, but the field never really got around to calling it that. I mean, we still just call it the quantum Cook-Levin theorem. And um, da -da -da, I just want to show you it again so we can close. Where is it? There it is. Okay, um, which is that the five local Hamiltonian problem is QMA complete. Uh, a lot of the details, again, were left in the notes uh, as exercises because, as you can probably tell, you know, we're quite pressed for time in this lecture. Uh, 
And so I, I strongly encourage you to go through and do those exercises. That's it for this week. Um, let us know as usual if you have any questions. And otherwise, uh, we wish you a good week. See you tomorrow in tutorial. A3 is due tomorrow. Have a good week.